This week on the Pressure Cast, we discuss the absolute best games of the year. It's Monday, December 28th, 2015. Everything happening in the world of video games is here, now on the Pressure Cast. Mash. Hey, hey, Pressure Pals, welcome to the 110th episode of the Pressure Cast. Video games are dumb.com's weekly news panic that posts every single Monday on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, TuneIn Radio, and America's longest running independent newspaper at shepherdexpress.com. My name is Colin, two coffees Tanner, and I am hyped up to talk to you guys about the best games of 2015. Alongside me here, Justin, two coffees, Inglebart. Got a second coffee today, fellas. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. One was an iced coffee, too. You're a wild man. Uh, defiantly, defiantly. I like hot and cold. I like combo. And over here, we have the most beautiful man in video games, Steve Cuff. Oh, it's good to be here as always, Colin. Oh, so happy. So happy to hear about all this good stuff happening this year. We are here to talk about the positivity. If you missed it last week, we talked about the biggest news stories of 2015, as well as the Big. worst games. This week, we're flipping it. It's all sunshine and rainbows. It's the best games of 2015. We have uh, a certain amount of awards that we're going to be giving out here. Uh, we don't actually have physical awards, so if you are the developer behind this game, please do not ask us to send you like a, I don't know, video games or dumb statuette. Uh, however, the top 10 games will happen at the end of the show, but stick with us. We have a lot of stuff we want to talk about, starting off with... Some games that came out this year that were good, but forgotten. These are not getting particular awards, but I think it's worth bringing them up in the conversation. I want to start off with uh, Techland's Dying Light, which came out in January, a very early release. This was the open world uh, zombie game, much akin to um, Dead Island, except they include a lot more parkour and climbing. So Parkour uh, zombie time. It was, you know, it was a very well received game when it was released. Uh, there is still a significant fan base for it. In fact, they have a remastered something or other version coming out next year. It's going to have a few enhancements to its lighting engine as well as all the expansions uh, included in some sort of game of the year version. Did you guys even have a chance to play Dying Light at all, or, or look it up, or anything? No, I, n I never had a chance to play it. Like I'm kind of interested in it, and it's definitely something that I'll check out once like a game of the year edition comes out and it's at a reasonable price and I'm yeah. not broke. I mean, that's but good. I didn't have a chance to play it. What I want to know is, uh, and, and here, this is the least relevant news story of 2015. What about that guy who won like a free zombie house or something from Dying Light? Do you remember that? Yeah. Where is that guy? Where is the zombie house? Why aren't there pictures of it on Reddit? You need to do some research on this one. I'm actually not positive, but I know they also had that contest uh, over the year where they were making fun of Bungie, where it was drinking the Mountain Dew, or was it Red mm -hmm. Bull? And they had their own contest for water, where you had to tweet them pictures of you drinking water, and they gave you free codes for DLC. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I thought that was just magical. Fantastic. Funny. A very good game, one that is easily forgotten. Truly Next forgotten. And you know what, Colin? You, you said that we're not actually going to give these developers awards, but I have a 3D printer at work so yeah. what i'll do is uh if I, I, made, mask, yeah. I spent two hours uh making a really cool penis design so i will print you Great. off a 3d printed pink penis and we'll and we'll write you did it on it <laughs> you did it you did it maybe you do like bright yellow yeah. on the top make sure yeah. not to inform them they're receiving an award at all just mail yeah, that just to mail them. that i'm just gonna mail that to you <laughs> tell your kids it's a rocket ship <laughs> a they won't know. Box, yeah the next game i want to talk about is one that it, i was not very fond of but i think it is an interesting game nonetheless is tembo the badass elephant remember how uh game freak the people behind the the Pokemon franchise released the game on Xbox One and PlayStation 4 this year, and nobody recalled it after about two weeks. Do it not was, remember this at all. It was an elephant game where it was a it was basically a platformer, an action platformer. It was very difficult. Uh, it had some really cool art to it. Uh, kind of a forgettable game all in mm -hmm. all, but yeah, no one remembers this game came out. It's kind of surprising considering the significance of the developer. What's so. the gameplay like in it? Is it like a fighting, like one button? It's, it's just a generic but slightly difficult platformer. So are you, jump, are you jumping on guys or is there like a... Defiantly, defiantly jumping on people. But the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, not guys. I mean like real people. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Get the microphone away from your face. Oh, I'm too loud. <laughs> You're really loud. Sorry. You can push the mic back a little bit. It's okay. <laughs> I thought I was being too quiet, so I kept getting louder. No. <laughs> All right. Sorry. You're okay. How about Evolve? Now I'm too loud. <laughs> Evolve, Evolve was... Evolve is actually a really great game. Some really cool online multiplayer. One person plays as a monster, and four people play as the hunters, and it, it, they all have different roles. That yeah, those five people are actually the only people that are playing that game right now. It, you know, it's just it's a shame. All because five of them? But that, that game was designed to be you know part of the competitive scene. I'm not sure where they got that idea. 
Uh, but, you know, I feel so bad for Evolve because a lot of people looked at it as this multiplayer-only game, and therefore it didn't deserve any attention uh, whatsoever. And that's really sad because that game, it was also all that DLC. Remember mm-hmm. it was $60 worth of DLC when oh, it launched? Yeah. Or maybe it was $100. What was um, the, what's the monster like if you play as a monster? Well, it's different types of monsters, and it's different environments. So the game starts off, and you're a very weak monster. You have to go around and kill other monsters and level yourself up while avoiding the hunters until you're powerful enough. Then the hunters show up. Somebody uses a dome, and uh, they can actually enclose the monster. Uh, guys, if you, it's actually relatively cheap. If you guys pick it up, we can play online together. Mm-hmm. I think you guys would really dig it. It was something incredibly special, and it was uh, the team behind... Uh, the original Left 4 Dead, not Left 4 Dead 2. Oh, yeah. see, I was going to say, yeah. And it does. It certainly feels like a spiritual successor to Left 4 Dead. Uh, it's just, I think all that, that DLC stuff left a bad taste in people's mouths, and then the community, uh, after the initial couple weeks after its release, sort of dwindled, so people just have not been into it. It's a real shame, because that game had uh, a lot of potential, and um, I, uh, hopefully we see a sequel out of that, because I feel that they could learn a lot of lessons from the reception of that game. It wasn't riding the hype train, though, huh? No. What about Dragon Ball Xenoverse? This was one of the biggest summer releases. <laughs> what in the world? I've never heard of this. It it's like great. It's like an MMO Dragon Ball thing, right? That's all I have to say about that. Then there's the Microsoft published Scream Ride, which was a game that involved you making your very own roller coasters. The fuck is that? You don't remember? It's see, a this, horror game. It's a horror roller coaster. This game. was a game that was at a bunch. It was at E3 and it was at some different press conferences. Scream Ride was basically roller coaster tycoon, where you had to build a bunch of rides and uh, you know you had to you had to induce fright. So you're actually going out of your way to scare people. It's like the reverse, where oh I don't want to ride that ride. It's too scary. The opposite was you have to scare the bejesus out of them. But the coolest mode in this game was where you had to build your own tracks to launch the roller coasters off the tracks and crash into things. Oh. And you, it was basically, um, it was like boom blocks almost. It's basically what I do when I play Roller, roller Coaster, Coaster Tycoon. Tycoon. Yeah. That's right. yeah, but it How was, can I kill these people in a horrible way? I think it's also available on PC. I'm not positive. But that mm-hmm. game is really fun, and I feel bad if nobody checked that out. It's one of the better Xbox exclusives this year, and if you have some time and that, that speaks to you, I think you'll have a blast with it. That sounds kind of interesting. I we'll heard it was a lot of fun, out. actually. I and, and you know, speaking of Roller Coaster games, uh, someone actually created in Roller Coaster Tycoon they created a roller coaster that takes 100 in-game years for the oh, person to compete. <laughs> complete, so they get on, and it's just like this huge map of this looping roller coaster, and then they get off, and they're 100 years older. So here's a game that wasn't very good for. <laughs> here's a game that wasn't very good for PC, and honestly, I wasn't the biggest fan of it. But uh, watching Evo this year really spoke to me. Was Mortal Kombat X, which mm-hmm. included uh, brand new fighting styles, uh, fatalities that can occur in the middle of combat if very particular. Uh, Circumstances really? are met. Huh. Yeah, of no, of well, the brutalities, but out of nowhere, you could just kill someone instantly. <laughs> uh, and it, and if you watch the competitive matches, it's one of the most entertaining games to observe. Maybe not necessarily play. Uh, it was a bit of a disappointment for me, considering I loved the uh, the 2011 Mortal Kombat so much. But a really special game in of itself. Did they get but rid of? They get rid of the weapons this time, or? No, I, I think there actually are weapons uh, in this version. I can't quite remember, but some really amazing art design and a uh, pretty cool story. But uh, yeah, another game that for some reason it was huge when it launched mm-hmm. and then just everybody forgot about hmm. it, which is rather sad. I know. I'm Mortal crying Kombat. over here. I got, a, I got a tear rolling down my, my, my cheek. And the final two are for the 3DS. Codename Steam. Now, you might not even remember this, but this was a big deal. They, they actually, Nintendo held a press conference at E3, uh, not last year, but the year before that, just for this game, where it was going to be a like an XCOM meets uh, Gears of War title that takes place in a steampunk world where you work with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the game, of course, had some rather significant problems with load times. They resolved that by patching it later. A really interesting and cool title that, sadly, most people y- do not remember. You know why I never played this game? Because I thought it was based on like a Cartoon Network uh, animated show. It's really good. That's <laughs> what it looked like. It's a game that you probably want to play on your new 3DS because it actually allows you to speed up the enemy turns faster, which oh. makes a huge difference because uh, they play out in real time, so you have to fast-forward them. And lastly... Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, oh, which yeah. is a game that I feel like is just under the surface of, of what most people are thinking about when they think of 2015, where people have, mm-hmm. they started playing it when it was released in February, and they haven't stopped yet, and it's a fantastic title. Of course, it was released in Japan before then, but in America, an incredible title that sadly most people overlooked. Is there co-op on that? Should we all play co-op together on I that? would love to play Monster Hunter 4 Stab Ultimate. Stab some monsters, baby. I will play with you guys no problem. I will do that. I will do that for you. 
When oh. are you going to do your Monster Rancher th- uh, 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 dive, by the way? I want to see Rancher? It. Yeah, where you put the CD in and it gives you the... Yeah, oh, no. yeah. That, that was a cool game. I'd love to see you do a dive of that. I, w- I would like to see it. You know what else I want to see you do? I want to see you do that with the regular Monster Rancher game. And I also want to see... Do you remember that like platforming game where you play as like, the, the single eyeball Monster Rancher creature? And no. you have to like, it's fucking weird. It's like, it's like this puzzle game where you have to jump on blocks and then the blocks you already jumped on, like fall away and you have to get to the end. It's like a puzzle platformer thing. I forget what it's called though. I have no recollection it's of that. Monster Rancher Jumpy Fun. I'm going to send you a link to it. You can, it's like regularly a dollar at huh. pawn shops and used video game stores. Interesting. Pawn shops? Mm-hmm. Pawn shops. Hard P, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, those are the games that you probably forgot about. We just want to get those out of the way. We want mm-hmm. to pour one out for those titles that probably you won't be hearing too much about ever again. But don't forget, they came out in 2015, and they were pretty damn cool in their own unique ways. But now it's time to actually get to the awards. We are working our way to the top ten. But first, we got a lot of stuff we want to talk about. Yeah. Starting it off with the award for best expansion of 2015. Best, best, best expansion. expansion. And it goes to a game that's very special and near and dear to the heart. Parts of these two gentlemen over here. The Binding of Isaac oh, Afterbirth. Baby. Oh, yes, Now, yes, I don't yes. play The Binding of Isaac, so oh. I don't, I'm don't. i not really familiar with this. Uh, Steve, you, you've mm. hands down invested more time into yeah. Afterbirth than anybody else. What made this expansion so special? Let me tell you, first off, Colin, t- uh, playing The Binding of Isaac Afterbirth is like touching the hand of God, so you have it not touched literally. the hand of God yet. Uh, this expansion is special because when the binding of isaac rebirth came out last year it was like the idealized version of the binding of isaac so the binding of isaac started off as like a flash game and then it moved over to steam and then from there uh they they brought out the wrath of the lamb dlc and finally when afterbirth came out ed, ed mcmillan was like okay this is the game that i wanted to make in the first place because okay. he did rebirth and that was a huge yeah, so difference rebirth rebirth was the ultimate game for him and afterbirth is basically like okay i finally made the game that i wanted to make now here's a whole hell of a lot more of it so there's oh my god there's probably a hundred new items uh there's a brand new mode called greed mode which is like an like an accelerated version of the regular mode of the game and more importantly there's more synergies than ever which is what makes isaac so cool so if you've never played isaac before Mm -hmm. basically it's really simple you start off in a dungeon there's a boss and there's an item room on every floor so you get items it looks like real 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 quick though could you explain to me what a synergy is sure synergy is uh so when you pick up these items there's four different kinds of items yeah well yeah there's there's active items there's passive items uh, and then there's like stat boosting items, things like that. But pills anyways, and oh yeah, and well there's and there's pills and there's trinkets. There's all kinds of shit. But anyway, synergies is is like how these items interact with each other. So for instance, uh, there's you can get a, a, a mod called technology, where instead of shooting your little Isaac ball tears, you get like a laser beam that comes out of your eye and like okay. a steady stream. <coughs> so there's right. another item that you can get called uh, rubber cement, and rubber cement makes your shots bounce off of walls so if you get that uh-huh. then all of a sudden you have a laser that like bounces off of rocks and walls so it's, it's just you know things like because that. because it's so randomized and now these combinations are creating even more items you never yeah. know what that next playthrough is going to be exactly, like. exactly. It's and, always and all different. of the synergies stack too so by the end of the game you just have these ridiculous combinations of unless things. you die unless you die uh and Which it is you will very be difficult lot, yeah yeah so it's it's a game where you can play for 200, 300 hours, and you're always having a new experience. It's it's totally wild. And now with Afterbirth, it's bigger than it's ever been. There's more characters. There's more everything. It's just it's awesome. The best expansion of 2015, The Binding oh of Isaac God. Afterbirth. Next week, and that was, of course, made by Nisalius, whatever it's called. Ni- Nicholas? Nicholas. Yeah, Nicholas. Now we need to talk about the best racing game of the year from Slightly Mad Studios and Bandai Namco Entertainment. Take it away, Colin. It is Project Cars. This year was rather interesting for racing games. Things like Forza didn't quite do it for me as much. It's still a great game. Not not just being Forza, but Project Cars brought it to a whole new level. Basically, imagine a multi-platform Gran Turismo. And what I love about this, Gran Turismo and Forza are very different philosophies. One is about excitement, while the other is about engagement. And that's what Project Cars does so well. It puts you in the in in the vibe of being a real driver and almost the uh the serenity of driving there was a point where i was driving around nuremberg it was raining outside and that race literally takes about you know 17 minutes to complete and just everything kind of washes away and i'm just in the zone driving my car not worrying about my opponents or anything but just driving that's a very special feeling 
that you can't really get from many other racing games. A lot of them are just about like turn left, turn right. You got to get in first place. Let's do this race. But this game, Turbo. Really, this game nails the joy of just driving. It's a beautiful game. And very relaxing to play. It's very. It can be relaxing. It can be <laughs> exciting. It it has everything that all the other racing games have, but it has that special element of just appreciating the craftsmanship behind cars. It makes you appreciate the science and the artistry behind vehicles, and that's something that we sometimes lose. Where you just go, "Oh, this car is a little bit faster. This mm-hmm. car's interesting. This car, it, you can." I feel like it's a racing game that allows you to express yourself, which is a philosophy that I've heard from um, uh, one of those Street Fighter players from uh, I forget what it was called. I thought you were talking about Madonna. I can't remember his name right now, but he was it was a Street Fighter player that always played as Ryu because it, he said Ryu allowed him to express himself, and he didn't mm. care if he won or lost. I feel like that's what you get with something like Project Cars. It's absolutely the best racing game of 2015, and it's inexcusable if you don't play it because it's available on so many damn systems. Wait, sell me on it. Give me one final thing to sell me on it here. Bottom line. There are so many different tracks. So many different modes of racing. If you even have, the, if you even have a bit of fondness for the um, the classic Gran Turismo games, you have to play this. Is it better than Daytona USA? No, okay. no nothing's better. Is no. it that cool Rolling Start song? Game over, yeah. Rolling Start. Let's talk about. Oh, sorry. The the award <laughs> the song for 2015's best game nobody played, and that sucks because it was super cool. From Pixel Knots is a game called Lost Orbit. What the fuck is that? What this is a is game that? where you play as a little guy with a jetpack, and you have to avoid the rocks. You're flying in space. You have to avoid the asteroids. Oh. And you can speed up, and you can slow down. So it's kind of like asteroids. <laughs> no. it's But what makes this game special is that it's more about story. There's actually another... Uh, there's a robot out there in the middle of space, some sort of android that's paying attention to whatever's going on out there. No one knows why he's there, but while you're just flying through these rocks... The entire game is narrated by that robot and the conversations he had with that human being, relating life on Earth, what he's thinking at that moment. It's very cool because you actually hear about the this guy who his spaceship crashes, so he has to escape, right? And now he's flying out there in space, and you think he'd be terrified, and he is initially, but then he starts talking about how beautiful everything is. He starts talking about the way that his family cooks dinner for holidays and what's the best food in the world and hearing these exchanges between this this very cold robot and this very excitable human it's just fascinating and it, it pays out because a the gameplay is fun they do find a way to make it really challenging for you to you know traverse these rocks you will die a lot but uh uh but b the narration the voice acting is fantastic it's a very affordable game lost orbit super good what is that on pc uh it's on it's on a bunch of different things you can get oh. on ps4 that's lost where i played it orbit. Really? interesting hmm. i'm going to check that out container thank you now we have the best visual novel from 5pb nitrous plus and published by pq it's oh, yeah. steinsgate on the vita oh i love this game this game was released in 2013 in japan but it just came to america i didn't play it justin why is steinsgate so engaging in a, in a, in a genre that many people would say isn't a game Oh, man, there's a lot of great visual novels. Actually, there's a couple other ones that just came out that I need to check out. Uh, it's just a great anime series. A lot of really Get good... Get that <laughs> microphone away from your face. Away from my face. There's yeah. a lot of really good characters. I mean, you're going to like... It. They they spend, a, they spend a lot of time setting up the relationships between these characters before they even get into the time travel sort of aspect of the show, which is when you start to... Te- uh, there's, a, there's a couple of, like, forced dating... Uh, well, well, relationship the, things that you don't really want to deal with, but so <laughs> wait. Now, why? That's all well and good. What's the basic early story of that? What's the? Give me the elevator pitch. Yeah, give me the setup. Game. Elevator pitch. Okay, so it's a group of students. <laughs> you uh, get closer to that microphone every time. You closer, and further away. No, you got to get away from your face. You don't hear you. I'm no, gonna, I don't. Hold on, I got. To, I got. To, sorry, podcast me. listeners. I'm going to turn up the audio in his headphones. Okay, Should we start over? No, no, you're good. Go. Go, just just say it. Okay, so you're a group of scientists. The main character is this guy who's a mad scientist that are trying to build these different devices. Um, most of them just seem like garbage at the beginning. You've got like a the the big one that they use most of the time is this microwave with a phone attached to it that That's can send it, it can send text messages into the past. Okay. <laughs> right. So you can, but then you have to figure out like what changed after you send it in the past because he only the main character can tell. Um, can remember what happened before the text was sent. Oh, that's kind of cool. So you have to go and see what changes what changes happened. So, um, and a lot of the time people won't let you see what they're sending into the past either. And you're like, well, what did that girl do? <laughs> but then there's like some small differences. Uh, it kind of has that great like mystery element to it that way. But also the writing's really sharp. Everybody's pretty funny. Are you making um, choices in this game? Or are you just reading? No, you're pretty much reading. I mean, sometimes it gives you the illusion of making choices, but... 
Uh, basically, it's kind of like watching the anime series, which is a great anime. Mm. I've watched a couple of, uh, episodes recently after playing the game, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is really authentic. This is exactly yeah. the and same it's, experience. And it's a longer game, right? It's actually a pretty long title. It's pretty dang long. I think it's going to end up, I don't even know how long it's going to end up being, to be honest with you. Uh, 40 hours, something like that? 40, oh, wow, hours? for a visual novel? That's yeah. crazy. Well, and I know the Vita is like a, a it's a good system to own if you like visual novels, because uh, what's that Virtue's Last Reward or something that came out like a year or two ago that people yeah, are absolutely in love with? This uh, sequel to 333 three, three or whatever it is. Hey, oh, s- yeah. Well, nine, no, 999. And I love the dang I played. Uh, oh, yeah, dang it. I played the first one, though. 333 was pretty good. It's the original. Yeah, apparently there's a new one that's supposed to be really... I don't know the title of it, so I'm going to stop talking about it. Okay. Let's talk about 2015's Best Disappointment, which is a, for a game that almost had it. Had a lot of cool ideas, but didn't quite deliver, but it still deserves some recognition. Tony Hawk. That's Ready at Dawn's and SCE Santa Monica Studio, published by Sony Computer Entertainment. The Order 1886, which is a game that's incredibly short, but I feel like people now, especially because it's just been so discounted, should absolutely check it out. It's a very fascinating game. That uh, it, it basically takes place, like it says, in 1886, where the Knights of the Round Table still exist in this world, and they they have huge political power, and they are actually fighting off evil werewolves. And that sounds so ridiculous, but they they add enough uh, gravity to the situations and the interactions with the characters that it becomes believable. And I think what makes this game so good is that its story is pretty predictable, but everyone, um, every character in the game, really has their own. Uh, beliefs. They have their own code, and they really follow it throughout the title, and that's what makes this very, very special. It basically mm-hmm. can, it, it's a it's a cover based shooter, not too different from Gears of War, but going through this world and seeing how society functions. You go from the slums to the more affluent areas, and just it's it's a gorgeous game. It's in a widescreen presentation, and it's one of it was one of the, my best experiences. That unfortunately just ends out of nowhere. Just ends. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, ends. and I think that's a, uh, an important distinction too. Like the fact that in terms of hours of gameplay, like it's short, but I don't think that's the biggest issue. Like m- no. most of my favorite games from 2015 are short experiences that can be completed in a couple of hours. But the problem with The Order 1886 is not that it's short, but rather that it feels like a prologue. Like it's a great proof of concept, and it feels like, like you said, when it ends, you're like, oh shit, we, where's the rest? <laughs> we are at the very top of the arc. We never achieve it mm-hmm. we it, we got our first act we got our second act and then we yeah. have 2.1 and it's over yeah there's literally like you you hit the game's climax and it's just like okay we're done but the climax comes out of nowhere either they yeah. they, they unveil some rather uh shocking Spoilers. information i'm not going to spoil we're not spoiling any of the games uh that are on this uh list but they reveal some information that's just absolutely shocking and then just abandon it immediately and it's mm-hmm. it's just the same and uh you know they set up for a sequel Never going to happen. No. But you could probably get this game for like five bucks at GameStop. So. Yes, you can. Uh, best use of color. I thought was an important distinction. We are in an age where, for some reason, despite all these fancy graphics, we don't always see uh, color in our games, which is rather strange. I don't I don't want to harp on the whole thing like, oh, every game is gray and black. But even when you see games that are embracing different hues, they uh, still... Still don't know how to bring it like they did back in the day. But luckily, we had a fantastic title this year from Rock Pocket Games and published by Sierra, Shiflings on the PlayStation 4. The fuck Ah. is that? One of the best looking games of the year. Just shocking that no one really followed this. It's a game where uh, you're these two little guppy fishmen in outer space. And uh, one of them uh, is is, uh, he's kind of gassy. So he has a tendency to fart. So it'll make his his spacesuit really puffy. (laughs) So we can't fit through things, right? Oh. But luckily, because you're connected via spacesuits, you can send the gas over to the other person and make them puffy. Oh, you can make him. You can suck in the farts. Yeah. So in that's other words, disgusting. Yeah, it's a puzzle funny. game where you have to figure out how to get the tiny guy through and the big guy through, hmm. and that's basically the entire game. It's just a very that's simple. Cool. It's a, if you are a fan of puzzle games, you really should check out Shiflings. It's a shame it didn't get more attention. Puzzle platforming at its best for 2015. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, the the hues of purple. The hues of blue, the use of, of white, just very gorgeous. Uh, if, just look it up right now. If you're listening to this, just type in Shiflings, and right away, you just these characters pop out because someone with enough uh, you know, artistic merit really went, okay, this is how we're going to bring out the background, and it's just a joy to look at. What about Yoshi's Yarn World? Oh, that's oh. a pretty game, too. Oh, my God, that game's gorgeous. Not on the list. <laughs> Sorry, we have the space fart game. No, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the best puzzle game of the year of 2015 is from Crunching Koalas, 
one of the free PlayStation Plus games of the year, and you guys both own Vitas and PlayStation Force. I hope mm-hmm. you have this, and if you don't, I highly encourage you to check it out, is Mousecraft, which is a game that basically merges Tetris and Lemmings together. Oh. It is a game where you have a scientist uh, cat who basically, uh, you have to set up different uh, Tetris shapes, and I do mean Tetris shapes. you got your, you know, your line blocks, you got your little... Squiggle blocks. Yeah, tetranomials. Yeah, did that face different directions, and you basically have to get the mice to collect uh, all three objects. There's these special objects before they get to the cheese, and it's a real mind bender. Sometimes it takes a little bit to figure these out, and once you figure out the solution, you're like, "How did I not see this? It's mm. so obvious." And that feeling is so satisfying. Mousecraft on the Vita. See, and I never, if you wouldn't have said anything, I never would have even considered that because I would have seen Mousecraft and I'm like, "Oh, cool, it's a Minecraft rip- ripoff." Horrible with name. Fucking cats and shit. Horrible <laughs> name. They could have called it Mouse Trap. Internet cat memes Minecraft. Oh, it's so sad. Same uh, problem with Operation Steam. Oh, codename Steam, yeah. Yeah, see, called. That's, see, 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 see. everybody called it Project Steam. I did too. Like codename Kids Next Door. That's what I thought it was. Now we have the best Infinite Runner of 2015, a very controversial genre of video games. Controversial. But it is. People say Endless Runner, like that's just janky crap. However, this year we saw a very cool game called Circa Infinity, which mm-hmm. Steve played a whole heck of a lot. Steve, what can yeah. you say about Circa Infinity? Well, I, I don't even know if it's fair to call it an Endless Runner because it's. I mean, it, it's. It you has go until levels. you die. Well, you, you do go. You, well, no, you don't really go until you die per se. We're taking um, the award away. Yeah. Okay. We're. Taking <laughs> Taking the award away, we're gonna we're gonna call it best fucked up platform. Endless endless runners have levels. We've it's they've the genre has evolved. Okay. okay, yeah. So basically, what this is is it's kind of like <laughs> what was that? Did you just that was so funny? Was that your butt or your mouth? Mm. It was his coffee cup. Oh, his coffee cup slash his butt. He's butt chugging coffee. It's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Circa okay, Infinity. Okay, so <laughs> let's start. We're going to start with this reference point. You've played Super Hexagon. Everybody's played Super Hexagon. I don't know if everybody has. Okay, have if it. you haven't, go play it. It's it's a great cell phone slash game on Steam. Uh, it's just a crazy mind-bending like puzzle-esque game. Anyways, imagine if Super Hexagon was a platformer, mm. and that's kind of where... Um, this game starts off. So what you have is you have a series of like concentric circles and there's like a little piece of the circle pie that's cut out. Imagine, kids, imagine a dartboard, okay? Mm -hmm. In case you don't know, a dartboard, you know how it goes red and then green. So it goes black, then white, then black, then white. Mm -hmm. And and there's a center right in the middle, just like a dartboard. Exactly. So it's kind of like a dartboard and you play this little guy and what happens is, is like the music is pumping and the level is like pumping to the music and you have to get to the open slice of the pie so you can jump to the, you know, inner circle of the dartboard and you keep doing that over and over again. And it's got this beautiful art style where it's all black and white except the enemies are all red. So they really pop. And basically what you have to do is you have to kind of like navigate around these circular worlds almost in like a 2D uh, Super Mario Galaxy kind of way. I was totally going to say that. Yeah. Um, And so you you navigate around, you avoid the enemies, and you have to jump into new circles. It's super disorienting but in a really cool way where you're sort of like bending your mind around like trying to figure out how this works. Plus it's almost like trance inducing because you've got this like going the entire time. Yeah, it's like you literally have trance music going. It's kind of like the Guitar Hero effect, where the where your brain turns off and mm-hmm. the hands are just moving. You're just in it. Yeah, you, know? you like literally get sucked into this game, and it's like hypnotizing. It's it's beautiful. It's super super smart. Like the level design is just. I don't even know how you design a game like this because it's so mind bending. You and know, it's it's really cool. Sounds like a big Qbert rip off to me. I, I think if you guys look this game up, if you're not if you haven't seen it yet, do not look up pictures. Look up a video mm-hmm. because and, I think yeah. if you look at a picture, it goes that looks like junk. And once you watch a video, it's like I. I, that does. I, I think I want to do that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> what is it? Pro- well, Project and, uh, Hexagon. It's called. No, no. It's a uh, Super Hexagon is a game that's kind of like. Circa it's called Infinity. Circa Infinity. Sorry. Another reason why I would say before you just run out and purchase this game, and I highly recommend because it it's cheap, it's gorgeous, it's so much fun. Um, watch a video first, not only so you can get an idea of what the game is like, but also so you can see if it's going to make you physically ill. Yeah. Uh, because I, I've recommended this game to people, and people are either like, oh my god, this is the most amazing thing I've ever played, or oh my god, I played for five minutes and literally wanted to throw up. <laughs> so if, if, you know, you might want to get some drama mean to go with it. The best secret JRPG of 2015. Secret, secret. Is Alpha System and Sony Computer Entertainment's 
Orishika, Tainted Bloodlines on the Vita. The fuck is that? You were telling me to play this, and I would probably love it. This is a game that unfortunately only received a digital release, and it took a lot of campaigning from a very small group of fans to get released on the Vita. Basically, the way that this game works is that it's about, uh, you have a, you have a clan, it, it takes place in basically medieval Japan. Okay. And the bloodline is essentially tainted. I don't want to spoil exactly why, but they'll need to reproduce, and you'll need to go through generations of people in the game. Oh, it's a really depressing one, right? No, no, no. What's cool about this game uh, is that uh, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the, uh, the Japanese art, uh, including something like The Wave. Uh, or the fisherman's wife, stuff like that. What Japanese art looks like, mm-hmm. and that's what the battles look like. It's this incredible hmm. mix of of like paper craft and and just like uh, Japanese folklore, like the way that they would dance, the way that they would dress. So when you're when you're delivering a fire attack, it looks like paper fire is flying out at them. It's absolutely stunning, wonderful music. And I think if you're a fan of PlayStation One era JRPGs, this is one title you must play. Oh my God, Justin's got a massive erection. I right can't and, wait and to play. I don't it. know if you guys. Uh, I don't know if the flash sale is still going on. I think it's going on until the 29th. I'm not positive mm-hmm. if this is on sale. It's only five dollars. Okay, right now. you got me. You absolutely must play this. And this game. is PS4. Is it Vita? What is this? It? Is Vita? Oh, Vita. Okay. Vita exclusive. That's why it's a secret. Cool. We're gonna take a break, but before we do, one last award is the Up Award. This is an award to a game that basically resembles Up. <laughs> and when I mean up, I mean it makes you cry in the first 10 minutes. And there's no game that will make you cry more faster than Moon Studios and Microsoft Studios' Ori and the Blind Forest. This is a very interesting Metroidvania-type game, which is pretty darn good in its own merit. But I think the thing that most people will be talking about for years to come is its introduction, which basically shows this big oaf and this adorable little kitty having a really great life, and then something goes wrong, and it's just not fair, man. It's not, like literally within the first 10 minutes, you want to sob your little eyes out. How could you do that, you sons like, of bitches? Why can't I control the characters right now? I would save their lives. It is devastating, mm. and is one of the best artistic statements of 2015, and I think something that is well worth looking at, even if you have no interest in the actual game itself. When we come back, we get the co-host award, right? Yeah, Shoot. who's the best co-host? Uh, <laughs> we have guests. <laughs> like picking a favorite kid. We have guests, guys. We don't have co Okay, <laughs> okay let's not get into that situation. <laughs> uh, best guest award. That's what I meant to say. Best okay. guest award. Uh, there we go. All right, great. Guys, we have so many more awards to get to, and then we also have to talk about the absolute best games of the year. We have our top ten list. I hope you're enjoying it, so stay tuned after this. All right, guys, the award for the best audience goes to you. That's right, listener Me? and or viewer. You are the absolute best audience because all you guys always check out the Pressure Cast every single Monday, and we really appreciate that. But, you know, we could use an award ourselves in the form of a five-star review and written review on iTunes. We just got a couple of more of these, which is fantastic. We were up to five, mm-hmm, four and a half stars. My God. We are so close. Please go to iTunes, give us five stars and a written review. It makes us more visible, which means more people listen to it, which means next year when we do our 2016 awards, and everyone's going, man, I love the pressure cast. You can be like, I'm the one that got them there. I gave them that review. You're getting a little ahead of yourself here. No, I'm, just, I'm trying to make sure that they understand they're on the uh, ground floor of opportunity right here, and as the pressure cast rises, so will they. What was that, like Patrick? What was that guy from Family Guy? <laughs> I don't know what that I voice was. I think you was. were going for Jesse Ventura, weren't you? No, oh, Jesse Ventura. I can't do a Jesse Ventura. The DARPA, if you would pay attention to DARPA, they're controlling the weather. <laughs> That's not Jesse Ventura. Chemtrails, man. Chemtrails. So please, fight back against the chemtrails. Go mm-hmm. to iTunes and give us a five-star review and a written review, and we will see you in 2016. Welcome back. We have more awards to give out right here, right now. Starting off with the best early access. No, wait, is this game actually out? I can't tell anymore. Game of 2015. Vlambeer's Nuclear Throne, which apparently came oh, out in December. Yeah. Clear. I just downloaded it on uh, my Vita uh, yesterday. I only got a chance to play with it for a little bit. But let me mm. tell you guys, where I didn't quite connect with The Binding of Isaac, I am connecting with Nuclear Throne, Maiden Game Maker. You spent a little bit more time with this, Steve. Actually, a lot more time. Oh, I spent a lot of time. Uh, I jumped in Nuclear Throne like last year when it was still in early, early access, and I've been playing it ever since. Um, I also I downloaded it for the Vita. Is it cross by? Like, can I play it mm-hmm. on PS4? Okay, I haven't tried it on PS4. I don't. It's not cross save. Oh, okay. That's that's interesting. Um, I I've played it quite a bit on the Vita. I don't like it as much as keyboard and mouse. Like, it's kind of hard with the little thumbsticks. Um, it's it's fucking beautiful with a keyboard and mouse. Oh my though. god. Uh, but anyways, what is this game about? 
Okay. Let me tell you, Steve. Let me, let me, let me tell you. Hold <laughs> on, I'll get this one. Guys. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so basically, what it is? Rhetorical. It's it's a bullet hell roguelike. Is that is that what it is? A, a, a fair a fair way to describe it. I feel like so, it turns into a bullet hell, but initially it's just kind of like it's like Zelda with guns. In yeah, a weird way. it starts off as Zelda with guns, and then about halfway through it turns into a bullet hell. Uh, you you kill enemies. Once you kill all the enemies on the screen, a portal opens up. You go to the next level. Cut also, down enemies down. drop rads, little radiation green pellets. You collect those, and you can level up uh, ten times, and you get different mutations that give you different abilities. Can we talk about the weapons? Oh, the weapons are beautiful. There's there's so many different weapons. Um, and they are each satis- – when somebody – when you kill something, it's satisfying in this game because they're burnt mm-hmm. little body or they explode or there's a bunch of other things that come yeah. out of it and – and, and part of that satisfaction, too, is the sound effects are so good. Not just Absolutely. for the weapons, but the enemies and the music is amazing. Like, the opening theme to Nuclear Throne is so catchy and Be cool. Beautiful pixel art. Mm-hmm. Absolutely game. gorgeous. It's so cool. Uh, the reason why I love Nuclear Throne and why I think it's a very... It's not just a good game, it's a special game. Uh, so the best book about video games that came out this year is by Ian Bogus, and it's called uh, How to Talk About Video Games. And he's got this great chapter where he talks about this concept of flow. So that game company who made Flower and uh, uh, Journey, they also their first game was called Flow, and that's because really great game. The programmer is literally obsessed with this concept of flow, where it's it's basically the sweet spot for a player where you kind of like get in the zone. Yeah. And he theorized that it was this like range where like your ability and the difficulty of the game, like that kind of middle range there. And Ian Bogus says, no, fuck that. Flow is where you hit this mark where you are at maximum ability and the game is at maximum difficulty and you're just fucking white knuckling going crazy. Nuclear Throne is a game that not only gives you that experience, but it gives you that experience after about like 10 minutes into the game. And, and you're just like, holy shit! Because death is inevitable. That is the only way that Nuclear Throne ends. It is endless until you die. You will fucking die. But until you get to that point, it's just like white knuckle thrills. Not and it's to, amazing. Not to mention that they also have the the daily and weekly events, which mm-hmm. is, a th- we've definitely seen that in other games. But it's it spelunky, feels- huh? Yeah, but it's, it really works in this title rather well because people are competitive when it comes to Nuclear Throne, and it's mm-hmm. uh, just gorgeous. Game Maker, what a year. Yeah, it's it's super cool. Definitely check it out. Uh, if, if you're curious about it, you don't know if it's the type of game for you, uh, there's actually a guy, and he does stuff on Twitch and YouTube, uh, and he's, he's mostly famous for streaming Content. Nuclear Throne. Uh, his name's Sleep Cycles, I think, on YouTube, and he does like daily videos. Check out his Nuclear Throne stuff. It's really cool. Coolest concept of 2015... From Len Carsey, I believe that's how you pronounce it. It's a Japanese company. And Atlas Games is Lost Dimension on the PlayStation 3 oh, and Vita. Yeah. <laughs> this is a game. This is the coolest concept ever. It's basically the end of the world because there's this guy. He's super powerful. He's in his evil tower. He's going to destroy the world. And uh, what do you do? you got to go in there with a crew of nine different people. And the, basically the way the game works is that one of the people of the nine is a traitor. And so you have to go through this JRPG, working together, building relationships, talking with people, but you also have to kill the traitor. But here's the problem. What if you kill the wrong person? And then the traitor kills somebody else. And then you kill the traitor. You're down to six people, and you still got to go to the top of that tower. Well, okay, it's a JRPG. Once, just go online, look up a strategy guide, you'll figure out who the traitor is. No, no. I'm, I'm afraid not, because the traitor is randomized through each playthrough, meaning that you'll have a lot more fun playing this game and second-guessing every decision and looking at all the evidence on there. Lost Dimension. Also, it has like, it has like a, a um, Parasite Eve-type battle system, which I really enjoy. Cool. Weapon customization? Or? Absolutely. Fantastic game. How long is the playthrough of that? I never beat it, but uh, it seems pretty beefy, like 40 hours or so. Really? Yeah. And you get a different traitor every time? Um... Well, not necessarily, but... Yes, but I don't want to say there's a lot more to it than just one trader, which is very, very cool. So, last dimension, coolest concept of 2015. Let's talk about the most technically impressive game of 2015. This isn't about graphics or, you know, gameplay. This is about what's technically impressive, and I can think of no better title than 343 Industries and Microsoft Studios' Halo 5 Guardians, which, if you if you look at that game, it's gorgeous, but underneath the hood, it, there's a lot going on. There are uh, different uh, resolutions that it's adapting to on the fly, constantly, mm-hmm. and you'll never notice it. You would actually need to actually be analyzing it frame by frame to go, wait a second, that just changed resolution there. 
It's so cool that it does this. It always keeps that very steady frame rate, and that's it. That's the reason it got the award is because I don't know how they did it. They're freaking wizards over it's at real gosh darn you, not have any, you don't have more to say about Halo 5? Uh, I feel you like know, we didn't talk about it that you, much. You year. shooty bang the aliens with I, the Master Chief. I had a lot of fun with it. I really enjoyed the single player. I enjoyed the idea that now you're working with uh, three other people or that you could be playing a co-op. I like the AI in the game. I, do, I, I think the weapons are fantastic. and It's just beautiful all around. So, you know, it deserves... It deserves more, but that's all it's got because eh, there were other games we needed to get to, including the best mobile title of 2015, which is also available on PC, from Moppin and Digital Devolver, Downwell. Oh, my God. I love Downwell so much. Uh, Downwell is its another roguelike game because, of course, right? Those are your favorites. Those are my favorites. And my favorites. Um, this one is like, okay, you know how when you're playing Metroid or Castlevania and, and you get to those sections of, of levels or whatever where instead of moving from right to left, you have like the big vertical drop kind of hallway thing, like the uh, like the end of Super Metroid, okay? So imagine an entire game where it's the final level of Super Metroid where you're going through that part where you have to like drop down that vertical hole. Battletoads? Uh, so you're, you're going down the entire time. Obviously, there's a well, you go down it. You mean like when you're doing your screw attack? Yeah, when you're doing your screw attack, yeah. Well, then you're not going down necessarily. You so you're, you're dropping down vertically, and you have gun boots. Now, these boots do two things. Obviously, they're gun boots. So they shoot, and shooting kills enemies. Uh, in addition to that, when you shoot, it, it kind of stops your momentum, so you kind of like, you know, uh, float in midair a little bit. So what you have to do is you just have to make it from the top to the bottom, and there's enemies and blocks to kill. But what happens is, is certain enemies you can jump on, certain enemies you can just shoot. And if you can do these things without getting hit, then you can build up your combo meter. And the more combo meter you have, the more points you get, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's almost like, and I've never experienced this before in a game, it's, it's an action game, but it really feels like a rhythm game. Yeah. Like, it's, it's so, so rhythmic. And... It's it's just beautiful. It's the kind of game where like I'll be playing it on my PC and then I'll go to take a dump and I'll and I'll like load it up on my phone. It's so good. TMI so, is so good. TMI of the year. Great when you're taking a dump. Great when you're not taking. He's a really dump. making a case it's for himself well. as guest of the year here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about the best golf game of the year? Easy. <laughs> what? McElroy. Say it no, again. No, say no, Rory McElroy. McElroy. Say it's McElroy. From, no, no, no. Because of the disappointment that was uh, Rory McMuffin PG Egg Tour. Rory, Rory. Uh, best golf game goes to HB Studios, which they published and developed, The Golf Club, which is a game that a lot of people <laughs> aren't going to remember, but I thought was pretty darn cool. What makes The Golf Club so special is, remember we were talking about Project Cars and talking about the being of the moment, the serenity of play. I remember that. Golf Club really nails that because instead of having some sort of commentator that's saying things like oh he's not doing too good out there what do you have to say about this well it's a tough course out there no 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 no. they don't do that you're just talking to your caddy and your caddy is this really interesting character that is like a real person you'll be you'll line up the shot and you'll hit it and you'll say something like oh that looks uh, that looks pretty good and oh man sorry spoke too soon Really simple gameplay like that. It's a game that allows you to build your own courses. It looks very good. There's some frame rate issues, but it's just fun to play golf. And this year when uh, PGA Tour just couldn't deliver it, I'm glad there was something out there for people. Well, and, and you forgot about the other award that it won, too. <laughs> what? Uh, it won Best Club Game. It uh, edged out Drive Club. So <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> is this the one with all the different caddies? No, there's just one caddy. Is this is this uh, Who's Your Caddy starring Ice Cube? Oh, Jesus. Let's talk about the coolest co-op game of the year. This is sadly the award I had to give to it because it just didn't fit anywhere else. Coolest. Is Nifless Games and Nep Knock Games Affordable Space Adventure on oh, yeah. the Wii U. Me and Steve played a lot of this game. This, Fuck yeah, we did. If, I, I, I'm so sad that more people did not give this game a chance. And if you own a Wii U, just right off the bat, you need to buy this game. It is uh, arguably the best use of the gamepad to date. Totally, this is it's a total proof of concept game, which is why it's sad almost because like it's never going to reach a wide audience. This is you can only do this game on the Wii U to make it what it is. Uh, but basically, it's like oh yeah, Adrian, fuck, did I just knock something over? I think Steve's overusing the term proof of concept. <laughs> you, you know, you well, think. I think you I, could, I think you could do this game with uh, you know connecting your phone to the PlayStation Four or yeah, Xbox I guess One. You, you could kind of do it like that. Uh, but basically, the idea is it's kind of like a physics-based puzzle game uh, it, where it's you two D two D game two D physics-based puzzle game where you where you have this uh, you obviously have a little spaceship and you have to make it through this planet. So you'll get to a point, say, where there's this giant space alien monster who's sensitive to heat. So you have to like 
cut your engines and then kind of float down below it and then and when you mean boost it, it, when you mean sensitive to heat the thing is you're not you're not battling these creatures no you're trying to avoid them so it, yeah on on the gamepad it'll show you uh two different metrics of like heat and power and what's working it's basically steel battalion on the wii u mm -hmm. it's a 2d space flight game so it's like oh this monster can't stand heat so you'll have to jettison yourself as fast as you can and then turn off your engine so that you'll float kind of and mm -hmm. hopefully the heat will be reduced enough to the, where you can't see you. It's basically it's a puzzle game, and it's brilliant because one person can control the spaceship while the other person's controlling, like, turning on the lights and turning on the engine. Uh, mm -hmm. Such a good game. So, yeah, you can do this with up to three people where, yeah, one person is in one, charge two, of, like, actually three. controlling the spaceship. The other person handles all of the, like, engineering stuff. And then a third person handles the uh, spotlight that you have, which is actually kind I of important. I didn't even know puzzles. there could be a oh, third yeah, person. You what do you do with, with three spotlight? people? But it's oh, crazy because around, as yeah. fun That's as it. it is as a single player game, when you have three people, it's it's almost chaotic but in the best way like you really feel like you're on the fucking starship enterprise like shouting things at each other and trying to work out problems i, I didn't play with other people and let me tell you i had a blast with this game so much fun everybody should play uh, affordable space adventure it is it, it would it really was devastating when i was looking up the top tens and i couldn't find a place for it because it, mm -hmm. it was a very good year and it's like man so please if you want a wii u affordable yeah. space adventures Pick it up, you jerks. Yeah, do it, dickheads. What are you playing on the Wii U other than that? You should get that. <laughs> we'll talk about what they should be playing on the Wii U. You know, video chatting with your mother. No, we have the Shut up, Steve. The <laughs> best remaster <laughs> slash remake from Rare and Microsoft Studios. There is no better collection of games out this year than Rare Replay. Rare Reaper. I would say Rare. even more than the Nathan Drake collection. This was an incredible remastering of, of a bunch of different, um, you know, rare titles. You had Xbox 360 titles on there. You had, uh, you had things like ZX Spectrum titles on there. You had things like Perfect Dark, Banjo-Kazooie. Uh, obviously, you're missing things like Donkey Kong Country. Donkey but Kong. <laughs> Donkey Kong Country. Donkey <laughs> King. <laughs> Some of these games are kind of hard to find, too, aren't they? Some of them are, you know, but they're not rare games. They just have to be published by Rare. <laughs> right now, this game is available for 20 bucks at most shops. You're getting 30 rare titles. And not only that, but you have a ton of local multiplayer with things like Battletoads, which also mm -hmm. included things like a rewind function, which is really handy. So many yeah, good... that game's bullshit. <laughs> well, most, yeah. of the, most of the 2D games on here include a rewind function. If you're a fan of, of the history of video games, and uh, I, I think you can do much better than to just look at this game and see how things expanded. Besides that, you get both Viva Pinata games. Uh, don't yeah, just look cool. at it. Play it, right? Yeah, uh, play it. I would say this is this is the one thing that almost makes me want to buy an Xbox One. Oh, you should, Xbox Ones are great. You should check one out. Yeah. They're fantastic. You wait, when that price drops. It's a great stocking stuffer. Yeah. Once Kmart goes out of business again, they can... Uh, <laughs> Again. Get us one for cheap. <laughs> How about the best confusing story of the year from Denition Games and Abstraction Games, as well as published by Digital <laughs> best Devolver? Confusing story. Hotline Miami 2 Wrong Number, which I could safely say was sort of disappointing compared mm -hmm. to where the, the original. The first one, yeah. 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 Hotline Miami 2, though. It's still great. How goddamn ambitious and confusing was this game? Ooh, God. I think my biggest issue with Hotline Miami 2 is Hotline Miami 1 was very difficult, but it felt like. The, fair. the difficulty ramped up gradually and it was always fair. Hotline Miami 2 acts like you just finished the first game five minutes ago and yeah. you're still at like maximum Boss Hotline levels. Miami. Yeah. yeah. So like the first, I think like I got stuck on the third level for like 45 minutes or something. It's horrible. The way I put it, I, I, I read the review it or whatever. It's like, you know, most people probably won't dig this game, but if you want to see what mm -hmm. happens when the maximum amount of unbridled creativity is just allowed to flourish mm -hmm. without, an, I mean, it could have used an editor. But mm -hmm. if they, if you just let them do whatever the hell they want, this is what you're going to get. You're going to be in war. You're going to be like following this racist psychopath as he goes through and, and does mass murder. You're going to be following a journalist who doesn't kill people. Like it, 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 it basically it is it is like the Godfather two of Hotline Miami mm -hmm. games. It follows so many goddamn yeah. characters and so many different arcs, and it does it wrap up nicely. No, it's really confusing, and the mm -hmm. whole game's confusing. You never get answers. The music's amazing again. Also, uh, this is of note too. If if you're listening to this in the holiday sale for PlayStation is still going yeah. on, I think it's like I think it's like seven fifty, and you get it for Vita, PS3, and PS4. It's like three way cross buy, which is a pretty sweet deal. I still so. think Hotline Miami one and two play best on Vita. 
Mm-hmm. I, I think it's a fantastic Vita title. Oh, yeah. If you're not using a mouse and keyboard, like it's it's pretty cool on Vita. And like uh, on the PC, next year, we'll start to get level creators uh, for this title so we can see people make their own stages. Mm-hmm. And that'll be very, very exciting. It's going to be like Super Mario Maker. We should have just had a category best digital devolver game. <laughs> yeah, they well they are. Very, they did. They very put special. out so many good things. Fucking Dropsy too. That point and click adventure game where you're a clown that gives people big moist hugs. Now, 2015's <laughs> best game that what? Colin yeah. is <laughs> best game that Colin is super suspicious of from everything unlimited. It is the beginner's guide. <laughs> the, the game that Colin is super suspicious I, of. You, I, didn't, you didn't like uh, Stanley Parable, did you? No, I like games that are actually funny or interesting ooh, or actually ooh, have good gameplay. Ooh. Uh, you know, Sick I, burn. I, I gotta I, agree with Colin on this one. How I, oh, how I spent my summer vacation, uh, it was me trying to write this essay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I'm sorry. I, I really did not like oh, Stanley what Parable. what a shit talker. I, dude, I like British humor. Mm-hmm. I like uh, funny things, and I like video games, and I couldn't find any of those. <laughs> okay. But did you like Hellboy Col- too? Colin is, in, Colin is in the minority opinion here. If you haven't played the Stanley Parable, it's worth playing. Here's why. Uh, the, the sort of banal point that it makes, which is uh, choice doesn't exist in video games. It's just an illusion uh, because everything is... Free will know, is an illusion. You know, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's basically the whole crux of the Stanley Parable. The cool thing about the Stanley Parable, which I, it sort of sets up what the Beginner's Guide is... Um, it's it's not necessarily that concept that's interesting. It's where you take it from there, like how you try and play the game. And the biggest kick I got out of the Stanley Parable is uh, when people would, would come over to my place and they'd want to play games. I'd be like, okay, we'll play something. But first, I want to see you play through this game. It's a fun game to watch people play through just to see the kind of choices that they make. Yeah, that sounds like a great game. Watch other people play. That sounds fun. It's, yeah, you want people hey, to watch hey, you maybe, play maybe, maybe, Yeah, maybe you've heard of Twitch TV or maybe you've heard of uh, Colin YouTube streaming that. live games every Wednesday night. I'm a very informative uh, individual. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun to watch people play the game because of the, how, how the, cho- the choices that they make and how they interact with the narrator. All right, but the beginner's so, guide. The beginner's guide, it's sort of a spiritual successor to the Stanley Parable, but but it's it's intentionally not funny. This is not a funny game. So this is a game about... To be the, fair, neither was the Stanley Parable. Oh my God, stop, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Colin just doesn't have a good sense of humor. I have good humor bars. Hey, the, hey, the hey you know what? You know what? Hey, listen to this. Colin doesn't think the Stanley Parable is funny, but he, he's also defended an Offspring record from 2013. I liked the one song. <laughs> I didn't think it was terrible. <laughs> I thought it was pretty awful myself. Just take that any way you want to. And he thought Mark McGrath wasn't even high in that video where he's high on Winnie Williams. Yeah, he's really he, high in that video. I don't think he is, man. Watch okay. that video. Okay, so anyways, The Beginner's Guide. What this is about, it's, it's not funny. It's a game about the concept of game design and how artists and their audience sort of interact and how criticism works. Yeah. So basically, the creator of the Stanley Parable... He made this game about his friend, who's also a game designer, but his friend only shares these games with like him and a few other people. He's really like self-conscious about them. So what you do is you go through and you're playing like individual levels that his friend made, and you're getting commentary from the guy that created the Stanley Parable, talking about the game, talking about the nature of design, and talking about how you're kind of always at this struggle of like, okay, this is what the artist really wants, but at the same time, can I change this to make it better for like mass audiences? Hmm. So the idea of like mass art versus niche art and how we respond to it's criticism. niche, niche Niche. Yes. <laughs> Have you ever heard of Nietzsche? Yeah, so I think this, if, if you're interested in all in like the inner mechanics of games, the nuts and bolts, and also the philosophy behind criticism. It's fucking brilliant. It's so much fun. You know what? In Colin's defense, and it's, it's though, really, it's really intriguing. You just kind of bored the crap out of me there with the, <laughs> you. You don't, you don't, you don't like the inner workings of games. You don't like to think about how I'm, how you interact with with media. I, no, I do, but not in games. Either. Honestly, you could. I, I, I honestly, I, oh I think you could just replace any creator with anybody else. You'll still get the same game. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I was, All right, I was just giving you a shit, by the yeah, way. No, I'm going to check it out, Steve. I, you I, better. You better uh, play it. I'm gonna, you're, I, you're overdriving, man. I, I'm going to overdrive. There's there's two things Colin needs to play. And Stanley that's, Parable and Beginner's oh, no, he Guide. He already played the Stanley Parable. And like, he needs to play Beginner's Guide, and he needs to play some more fucking Isaac. Okay, oh, so we, we've got six Isaac. more of these to go, guys. Let's, let's cook right through these. Here's the best game with the worst release timing of 2015, Battlefield Hardline. Oof. Battlefield Hardline is a game that I enjoyed very much. I actually just like playing Deathmatch. It, it actually had very good level design, and uh, I liked the way that the guns work. It was a very fun shooter. Uh, unfortunately, it's about cops shooting a lot of people, and uh, Ferguson happened. That's never going to be a good time yeah. for that game to come out. Can we also touch on the point that you actually have the ability to arrest people in that game? but Only in single player. Yeah, only in single player. But you're player. never going to do it. 
Yeah, it's and there's no reason to do it. You, got, you gotta shine the people in the face. You have to shine a flashlight. You have to shine your badge like a flashlight, which basically makes you like a mall cop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not good. So it's kind of like Narc on NES. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Just make everything compared to Narc. We also had the uh, best Nintendo game, not in the top ten, Super Mario Maker from Nintendo EAD Group Number Four from Nintendo. Uh, I know, Colin. You you had some issues with this game because it's a good game. No, no, it's really really shaped up mm-hmm. since its release. Yeah, I, I think they've they've done a lot to polish it since it came out, and a lot of the complaints, like like you had, and understandably so, is like uh, the created levels weren't so great from some people especially at the beginning and some of the higher rated ones that were easier to find on the actual game itself like when you went into the other people's level section or whatever were just like oh look there's just a pole right in front of you and you touch it and you win mm. hooray um and, and i understand that but i think the most fun that i've had with mario maker is not playing other people's levels it's making like, your own right? yeah exactly like th- when once you say okay this isn't so <laughs> i can play other dumbasses <laughs> shitty mario games right. but so I can I can do things for me. If you make it about if you if you're a selfish son of a bitch and you play Mario me. Maker for you, yeah, just like that song by Blessed Union of Souls. I, uh, it, that's that's when it's good. But it's really grown into its own. I think that there was a, there were a number of problems with its release, including the way that it would it would parse out uh, new content to you, which mm-hmm. was uh, that was already on the disc, which was kind of yeah. maddening. But once it was all there, it became a lot of fun trying to just map out exactly like oh how far can Mario jump, and the way that you could just press a button and go right into your created stage. Just like that, just bam. And mm-hmm. they literally have a snapping sound, like someone snapping their thumb. It's that fast from creation to play, and it, I, I, it really educates you on how difficult it is to make these Mario stages. I think that's a very valuable resource, and I hope a lot of kids are playing it, because that's going to make the future of video games even better. I just, mm-hmm. I'd love to see a Sonic the Hedgehog level generator thing like this with the old school Sonic. You just, it's just it's a fucking... Uh, trash disposal just grinds up shit and just throws <laughs> it. Oh, it. it's just like oh well, that's a pretty good idea just uh let's add an extra character and How throw it in the trash let's make it 3d uh, oh jesus let's move on to <clears throat> the best 19 year old girl simulator hey you're into this aren't you colin all right guess what it is steve it's uh sybil it is Sybil. Which also is Justin's favorite 90s television sitcom that isn't Murphy Brown. Uh, Sybil Shepard? She was a hilarious <laughs> stand-up comedian. Uh, okay, so Sybil is uh, a game by a woman named Nina Freeman. And I think one of the biggest problems that I had with games in 2015, and this isn't necessarily like a direct criticism, but it's just a reality. Games are fucking exhausting now. It's true. Everything is like, okay, 100 hours open world crafting this that the other thing is like god damn you know i got a fucking job i don't have time for this shit uh so i was really looking for games that were not only like shorter literally in the amount of time they take to complete but also kind of more personal individualized stories and sybil is probably the best example of that so um what it is is it kind of plays off the whole desktop simulator thing that became popular with things like her story and stuff like that where uh, you have you have this 19 year old girl's desktop and you can look at her pictures and, and read her chat logs and things like that. It's creepy. I can't do it. W- come on. You're creeping on 19 year old girls on Tinder all day. You might as well <laughs> do it like this. No, that's my brother, man. That's not me. <laughs> Shout out to Eric. <laughs> that, is not, that is not true about Eric. Holy crap. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so what you find out eventually is uh, she's sort of she's playing this online fake MMO game, which you can also play. So there's a game within the game. Yeah, but uh, don't spoil it because yeah. this is a pretty good story. Yeah. So there's this good story. But basically, you're, you're sort of cultivating this relationship with this other guy. And this is sort of like her first love. So, you know, considering this is a game ab- about a 19 year old girl falling in love for the first time, which if I were to put like a list of my own interests when it yeah. comes to games or media in general, Romance. that would be pretty low on that list. It's really compelling. It's a great story. It's a really cool idea that's What's this guy like well. that she falls in love with? No, don't spoil it. This, I can't spoil that's it. The yeah, that's the whole game. That's the whole oh, game. Okay, sorry, it's only a couple hours long, too, um, but it's it's so engaging, and it's exciting, too, because I want I want there to be more games like this. I There's there's so many game tools that are available to people that don't know how to make games in the traditional sense that can make these really cool narrative-driven personal stories. I want more of this shit, so play this game and then go fucking make your own game. Surprise of 2015, a game that I did not expect much out of, but still happened... To surprise me. <laughs> Still happened to I surprise me. I have a podcast. Uh, <laughs> Until Dawn, which was released on the PlayStation 4 this year. A uh, game that was been in the works for, God, 
I don't even know Wait, how long. Wait, let me count the years. I don't even know. But let me play to you this way. At one point, it was shown off at uh, a demo kiosk at a number of different uh, shows with move controllers on the PlayStation 3. It's been a long time coming. It's a interactive. Uh, it's, sur- been a while. it's an interactive slasher film, a horror movie starring a bunch of teenagers who had a, f- a couple of friends pass away. And so they reunite back at that exact same snowy log cabin one year later, and shit starts to go down. Mm. It's amazing how it jumps perspective. And there comes this point where you start to empathize with their situation and you are role-playing this to the point where, oh my God, what am I going to do? Do I take the left or do I take the right? And it's like, well, that place is darker. That's kind of scary. But you know what? Maybe he won't be able to find me. Maybe he won't be able to see me if I run down this dark way. You start making choices just like they do in horror movies. And the best part is... Everybody can die. This entire group Mm -hmm. of people, everybody can die. There's the butterfly effect. Or nobody can die if you're really, really good. And so it's amazing because when you look back on it, even though you made those choices, it feels like it it couldn't happen any other way. But it can. And that is so rewarding. And I I had a real blast with the game. Not one of the ten best games of the year, but a very special title. Who's the killer? Is it one of you? Shut up, man. Also, no, I need to know. Who's the spoiler. killer? It has the best performance of the year. There's this psychiatrist <sighs> who is so unnerving as he talks to you. He just looks you dead in the eyes the entire time, and he goes, Ah, how are you enjoying the game? Yes, you made this choice. May I ask why? <laughs> it's so unnerving. <laughs> Spoilers. Well, I think the coolest things about Until Dawn are, one, your choices really do have weight to them. It's it's not like a lot of other games where, oh, you have four choices, but spoiler alert, three of them result in the exact same thing. Everything you do has uh, like repercussions that carry through to the end of the game. And the other thing I like about it is... Um, all the complaints that I have about the games of David Cage oh, are yeah. like addressed here. This is like everything I want a David Cage game to be. It is the best uh, Quantum Dream game that is not by Quantum Dream. Mm-hmm. But that's not an award we're giving out. <laughs> we <gotta laughs> you might as well we give did. it that award. Give it that award. The award. best story of 2015, which is not a, unfortunately not in the top 10 because you know it, the gameplay doesn't always work out too well, is the Chinese Rooms, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, which is a fantastic walking simulator. Yeah where you are just exploring a town and observing the after effects of, of something. You can't even explain what it is. You're not sure what it is. Sounds like the beginner's guy, but not as good. It's a, what's amazing about this game <laughs> is that you, you encounter previous conversations, but they're all out of sequence. Sometimes mm-hmm. you hear the later effects, sometimes you hear the earlier effects, and then it just kind of carries through to the middle. The, the, the stories are so relatable uh, that it, I, I, I'm... You don't even see anybody. It's a walking simulator, so you don't even see these people. But there are dozens of people on this cast, and you grow attached to some. And watching the way that this this uh, this event occurs and the way that it relates to them is breathtaking. It has some of the best acting of the year. Wonderful acting. Unfortunately, like the walking, it's too slow. And I know, <laughs> I know that that's not. Uh, they probably went for something intentionally, but I'm sorry. Uh, There's a secret run button. That it's a gradual run button. <laughs> Gradually, <laughs> secret get- run button. But this, uh, it, it was one of those games where I was going out of my way to search every single room because I had to hear the story. Afterwards, I discovered that, no, you actually have to do that if you want to complete the game. But it didn't matter to me because I wanted to hear what happened next. I loved the characters. Mm-hmm. Absolutely the best story of the year. What about her story? And the last award before we get to the top ten is the award for the game that has to be somewhere in this conversation because we're stupid. Fallout 4? Yokai Watch on yeah. the 3DS. Shout out to my white dog squad. Uh, Red Cat team all the way, baby. Shout out to my white dog squad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, we're not talking about the white supremacist group that you joined last week. <laughs> that was really awkward, man. That you, thought, yeah. you thought it was about I thought white I was going to a Scientology you meeting. You, th- you thought it was a Yokai <laughs> Watch uh, fan group, and then you know you were talking them on Reddit. I'm like, wait, wait a second. Oh, yeah, what are you guys, watchdogs? <laughs> <laughs> so just that's the stupidest fucking thing. Uh, no, but Yokai Watch is just it's this very silly game. Made a bunch of jokes about it because it was always on the uh, the Japanese. Uh, weren't jokes. We were serious. Well, yeah, you know, it was on the <laughs> chart park. Let me tell you, I actually played Yokai Watch and I had an absolute blast with it. I think kids are going to adore it. It's a very unique Pokemon style RPG that has a very unique and interesting combat system that I would describe as. Unique. <laughs> I just, so that, yes. that was, that was, is that your back of the box quote? My adjectives are running out. Oh I believe God. he's used the term unique too many times here today. It's a unique word. So that's 
Okay, great. What a way to wrap up this part. We are going to be actually diving deep. If you thought this part was going too fast, we've got 10 games to get to. Going in depth with them after the pressure cast returns. Stay tuned after this. Bonnie, let's try up and take Wham Wham to the head doctor. Oh, uh, Fred, I don't know if that's such a good idea. These doctors are going to give him uh, stuff to keep him from getting sick. Wham, wham! Don't worry, Bon. While the doctors are doing whatever the hell they're doing to your kid, we're going to sit here and listen to the Pressure Cast. It's my favorite podcast all about video games. It's great if you're going on a wild trip. <laughs> you got that right, Bon. Here's a lucky strike. So anyway, if you could do everybody a favor and go to iTunes and review the Pressure Cast, give it a five star and a written review. That'd be great, Bon. Hey, this lucky strike is smooth. Wham! Uh wham! Oh, they're really wham whamming away at him in there. All right, well, Bon, Bonnie, you lit my jacket on fire. Oh, oh my God! Sorry about that, Fred. I was trying to do a five star review. Oh my God! Well, you just go ahead and do that on your eye rock. All right. This one? Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> that's enough of that. The pressure cast, right? All right, that's enough. It's time to list the 10 best games of 2015 oh. on the pressure cast right here, right now. Wait, I thought we were going to talk about the 10 best Bon Jovi records of 2015. Absolutely not. No. We need to start off with number 10, which also happens to be the best Metroidvania game of the year. Axiom Verge. Oof. Axiom Verge is one hell of a title. It takes all the concepts of Metroid that you're familiar with and changes them up in some really fantastical ways. Uh, in fact, it almost uses the uh, 8-bit graphics of Metroid uh, to trick you. It, you know, it gives you this pretext where you're like, oh, I understand how this game's going to function. But sooner or later, you begin to discover that this world has visual glitches like an old-school NES game, and you have to use your glitch gun to rebuild them or to tear them apart. Mm -hmm. You can turn enemies into entirely new creatures that look like busted different flashing images that have different powers. It's fascinating. It almost reminds you of what would happen when you uh, you know mess around with your game genie and put in random codes and see these messes occur. Did any of you guys have a chance to play Axiom Verge? Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, um, I mean... It, it's a big love letter to Metroid. It's it's probably the the I, I don't know. I, the biggest I'd say love letter to Metroid. It's it's definitely a pastiche of Metroid, and it you can tell the the game developer absolutely loves it. But he it, the the changes that are made to Axiom Verge to differentiate it from Metroid are not only cool, but they're also self referential enough to make it kind of a little more interesting. Gives it an extra layer. It's a cool game. It's a lot of fun. It's one of those games that could have just ended with a wink and a nod, and be like, "Hey, remember Metroid?" But the the narrative about this uh, essentially universal genocide that occurs, and you're this regular person that's trapped in the middle of it, and you're not you're not you're not battling against to stop the genocide. That's not what's going on. It already happened, and you're just showing up and trying to survive. And that's a really fascinating, dark story. It's quite haunting and has some of the best music of the year. Highly recommended. Number 10, the best games of 2015. I will be playing that soon. You guys are going to hate me here. I'm always too late. Mm -hmm. Probably. We already do. Number 9, the best first-person shooter oh, of the year as well. Treyarch's Call of Duty... Black Ops 3. I don't hate you for this. What can I say, guys? Mm. Black Ops 3 seems to take everything that's great about the series and make it even better. It's Treyarch back at the helm. What I love about this is that they, it's all about the multiplayer. Let's not beat around the bush. Single player is interesting, but I love what they did with the multiplayer. Once again, allowing you to use a point system. Like, okay, do I want to have a, you know, a pistol here and then have a gun here? Actually, you know what? I want to have three attachments to my gun because I want to become proficient at sniping. I'm going to get rid of the pistol. Hmm. It's a really fascinating system. They include wall jumps and uh, wall running and boosts, and it's just, it feels so good. It feels better than almost, uh, it feels better than Titanfall in a lot of ways. It's such a special shooter, and I think a lot of people will look at that Call of Duty name and just say it's not very good. And, you know, it's one of those games that I had trouble putting down. Like, I had to say, nope, mm. can't do this anymore. I didn't expect that. I mean, I liked last year's game. It was one of my top ten. Last year I had a Call of Duty game. I thought it was fantastic. This year it blows it right out of the waters. But it's only number nine because there's so many amazing games we need to get to. Don't worry, guys. We're going to get to some conversational games Let's here. Let's move on. Guys, nope. sp spoiler alert, I didn't play the new Call of Duty. I'm sorry. <laughs> number eight, which is also the award for the best intro, is... Tales from the Borderlands, the Telltale game. 
Did you, Justin? You want to make any more noise? Just moving your damn. I know headphones it sounds around? like you're like I wasn't looking at you when you were moving your headphones, and if I was a listener right now, I'd think that you just had your your cock out and you're just scratching your pubes next to the microphone. Could guys, have been your pubes. Okay, guys. <laughs> Telltale games. Yeah. I'm burnt out on them. I don't want to play anymore. You don't want to play anymore? Really? Are you really? I really am. But you know what? I played Tales from the Borderlands. I'm not even a Borderlands fan. This game's amazing. Oh. It is one of the best stories of the year. Some of the best characters. Some of the best voice acting. It's absolutely stunning in the way that it weaves its stories in and out, almost in a, uh, a Guy Ritchie narrative, hmm. you know, where things just set themselves up so perfectly that when it all falls apart, you can't help but laugh. You don't have to be a fan of Borderlands. You don't have to be a fan of Telltale games. This is something incredibly special. It, it's 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 a game that uh, maybe doesn't have the best ending. It doesn't wrap up as cleanly. But I, I got to tell you, every time an episode ended, I wanted to continue, not because of the mm. cliffhanger, but just because I wanted to see what everyone else was doing, where the characters were. It's amazing, and, and you have to play this game. Tales from the Borderlands, my God, Telltale, more of this. This is what I want. Like this compelling characters. It's all about the characters. You just keep coming back, don't you? And the choices matter. They always matter. On the okay. pressure gas. Absolutely. <laughs> Number seven, we have the best action RPG of the year from From Software and Sony Computer from Entertainment. From. Oh. Number seven is Bloodborne. Justin, you played a lot of Bloodborne. I did. You've also played a lot of Dark Souls. What makes Bloodborne so special? Compared to Dark Souls? Um, or just in general. In By general, it's just it's very rewarding. It's extremely frustrating. You'll see a boss that you just don't want to fight, and you're just <laughs> terrified of him. And then you go in there, and he's going to demolish you 20 times in a row like you expect. But then you figure out some secret, uh, not even a secret way around to, like, to beat a lot of these things. And mm. it's just, it, there's nothing more satisfying than like, oh, that thing was horrifying, and I really didn't want to fight it. And I finally killed it. But then the thing right after, oops, sorry. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> But you then, okay, Steve? But then, <laughs> then you, then you know, the next thing that you have to fight is even worse, like even scarier <laughs> and even freakier. <laughs> the I, atmosphere is really good. Like the music is great. Uh, maybe enemies respawn a little bit too much, and it's just a little unforgiving. So I had to move on at one point. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those games where I think yeah, I also think it is the superior to something like the Dark Souls series right now. I think Dark Souls One is one of the best games of all time, and really, it's hard for anything to beat it uh, because of how perfect it is. But after playing Dark Souls Two and then moving on to Bloodborne. Just it, it encourages uh, it encourages the way you play rather than the way you uh, customize. So it's not about mm -hmm. like, well, I'll put on this bit of armor and I'll use this shield. Because it doesn't really I, matter. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It's more about like really getting that vibe of being like, okay, I'll take out my gun and shoot him right then. It's more about strategy, I feel. Mm -hmm. or, well, you can equipment. just level up forever too. Yeah, absolutely. Which I definitely got sucked into when it gets too hard. I'm just like, all right, keep putting You're more just points grind. in I mean, Yeah, I just grinded for a while. The art in this game, seriously, the way the game looks, it's it's so gothic and perfect. It's like Vampire Hunter D. It's just this, this maddeningly beautiful game. The early parts are a little bit too repetitive. You know, but, yeah. it, but some of the enemies, you know, those guys that have the canes uh -huh. that just walk around there, mm -hmm. they're these cloaked figures. I don't know what you, but every time I see one of those, I have such a sense of dread, but I'm also attracted to, you know, go over there and just look at them because they're so stunning in every single detail. And it's funny, like the first couple of times you'll fight a guy like that, uh, they'll be really easy. Yeah, I know. And then you get in situations where it's like, well, these guys are just killing me like left and right. And these aren't even one of the harder enemies that I've been. I, I think it also, it, um, it, it broke away from some of the issues with Dark Souls after a while where it was just memorizing the pattern of attack uh -huh. and then just capitalizing on that, whereas this feels like so much more offensive than defensive. Well, counterattacks give you your health back, so sometimes you can make some really bold, uh, like, oh, I'm just going to go at him right now. I don't know why I'm doing this. I feel like it really pushes you. Off. And I, you know, I feel like it really pushes you forward, and I, I really love the music of the game as well, especially in the uh, the place where you level up. It's uh, it's really gorgeous music. Oh, um, the Dream, something Dream, Hunter's Dream. I mean, it's, it's cheesy storyline. It's a game that I think if you like those types of games and you don't own a PlayStation Four, you kind of need to buy a PlayStation Four just mm -hmm. for this game, which is uh, probably sad for people listening to this. Why is it on PC? It was a, you, Sony. It's interesting to me how popular this game was because I love really challenging games, and even for me, it was a little much at some points where I'm like, "This mm -hmm. is just frustrating," and uh, I don't. Really but the funny thing is, this. is most most people seem to think it's the easiest like Souls You're series right. game. I th I, for me, the philosophy of buying this game is if it's challenging, push forward. If it's impossible, turn back because there's probably somewhere else you're supposed to go. And and it's I, not completely linear either. You can go different ways. And I, I love that you know the weapons here, the transforming weapons, giving you two styles of play for each. I mean that that razor sword just from the beginning. 
it's so brutal. It's disturbing and yet so rewarding because you'll experience this moment where the same stupid creatures have been killing you for like two hours straight just trying to get past this one area. Townspeople are killing you. Oh, those, those townspeople. There's this, there's this environment where there's these townspeople that are burning bodies and they just turn around and they're killing you nonstop. There comes a point where you return to that environment after like a dozen or so hours and you're like, oh, hi, <laughs> remember me. Going on a rampage, yeah. <laughs> and, no, and like they'll hit you and it barely takes off any health. It's, it's everything that you want out of an action RPG. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's incredibly special. And uh, I hope more people get a chance to play it. That was number seven of the top ten best games of the year. Number six, you guys are we're, we're don't worry. The the bottom five are games that you guys have really engaged with, so don't <laughs> worry. Number six is the best music game of the year and one of the best ideas to come around. And you might be you might want to hold your ears and scream when I say this, uh, uh, but you're listening to NPR. No, uh, but you are. And Robert Siegel, I'm Ira Glass. Uh, <laughs> I just like the idea they're all just hanging out in the same like uh, gym closet and they just pull them out and sit in front of a microphone. Mm-hmm. Um. It's got to be Guitar Hero Live, and it has nothing to do with what's on the disc. Guitar Hero Live is a game that involves you performing in front of a live audience, and people give you thumbs up or thumbs down, woo! But Guitar Hero Live, and also it has a very great controller, a six-button controller, so three top, uh, stacked on top of three. You don't have to move your hand around anymore. It's just about uh, uh, proficiency at your fingering. <laughs> uh, Creep. But Guitar Hero TV is the other mode available on here. And a lot of you were, were complaining, you can't buy DLC. You just have to pay for renting the songs, which they just included in there because why not? If it makes money, who cares? But Guitar Hero TV is this free service where you just tune in. There's two different channels. They have different blocks of music, just like MTV2 used to have back in the day. They have their own bumpers to advertise the channel. Who are they advertising the channel to? The this, people that are already there. <laughs> yeah, but it's this unique, beautiful art, like little short films to advertise. You're watching the two, or you're playing live. It's just music videos, and you're playing along to it, and you're, you're just placed in a room with 10 other players that have about equal uh, ability as you, and that's it. And you can't fail out of a song whatsoever. And you can change the difficulty on the fly. You never know what's going to be coming up next. And it's just so exciting. It's like listening to the radio. It feels like you're really being in the moment of the game. It, it's hard to explain. And when a song comes on that you really want to listen to, you're like, oh, hell yeah, I want to get really good at this song. Not only that, but Guitar Hero Live has the benefit of uh, diversity. There are some songs that are very slow-paced and like seven and a half minutes long. There are other songs that are only two minutes long. And you're getting all the music videos. It, it just it feels like it's a celebration of music and of, of uh, an era that's really gone these days of music television. And... I don't know. It, it's it's incredibly special, and I highly encourage anyone to check it out. I keep saying that, but th- this game especially, I feel, got a real bum rap because people said, oh, great, it's another music game. But this has an idea that I think will be embraced in the future, and really, I, I think this will be a real defining moment. And if not, it will be that idea that many people said, what the hell happened there? Guitar Hero Live for Guitar Hero TV, number six, man. The future of Guitar Hero games. Number five, now is here wow it is what a workout what about splatoon on Ooh. the wii u steve hey why is splatoon number five well colin there's a couple of games that came out this year that made me fall in love with online multiplayer again uh and i have a feeling that one of them is going to be a little bit further up our list uh but splatoon is great because what are you elbowing me for you fucking creep shut up keep talking <laughs> Shut up, keep talking. That's the quote of the year. Yeah, it's quote of the year, 2015. Uh, no, Spl- Splatoon is great because if you were to ask me a-, a year ago what I thought of, like, okay, what if there was an online squad-based shooter? How interested would you be on a scale of 1 to 10? I'd be like, negative 42. I hate human beings, and I don't want to play that game. Why 42? Um, Splatoon is great because you're always useful. Whether you, it's your first time playing or you've you've dropped like 50 hours in the game, there's always something you can do and you're always an important part of your team. As long as you're firing your paint gun, you're doing something productive, which is really cool. It's important to point out the way this game functions is rather than being a competitive shooter where you're supposed to kill each other, the game is based around maps that uh, mm-hmm. can be covered in paint. You have, you know, one side has green, the other side has purple. You have to cover the entire stage as much as possible in your paint until the very last second and then a big fat cat goes up on the screen with his two little flags 
Briggs and goes, this one had 51.9% and the other person had 48.1%. That doesn't add up. I don't know. Close uh, enough. But that it would, <laughs> But that, uh, it, it, you know, just that idea of covering it with paint rather than um, killing your enemy. So, mm-hmm. when you, so the environment is the enemy in a weird way. Yeah, well, and, and when I think about why I'm bad at Call of Duty, it's because people are screaming into their microphone telling me how shitty I am and yelling nasty words. And also, when I try to shoot them, I miss and I hit the wall, and then they shoot me in the head. So in this game, when I miss and I hit the wall, I'm actually doing something good, and there's no voice chat, so I don't have little shit lords fucking screaming in my ear. I kind of wish there was still voice acting as an option, especially when you're trying to play with your friends. Yeah, I, I wish if, if you could do like if you could do buddy chat with people that are actually on your friends list, I'd be cool with that. But at the same time, it's like I can throw up my laptop and, and just start a, a Skype conversation if I really need to. This game just has a really joyous vibe. It's that Saturday mm-hmm. morning sunshine vibe where you know, you're playing as these children that can also turn to squids, and uh, there's something so liberating about you know covering an area in paint and then quickly uh, swimming through it by turning into a squid, and also hiding underneath that uh, ink. So when somebody walks by, you just pop out and take them out. Mm-hmm. And the variety of weapons from things that are very very powerful but have short range to long distance weapons to ones that shoot very fast. You might say, what? All games have that. But it's the philosophy behind it of covering up the environment. So when you're at a very high ledge and you have a rapid-fire gun, you're just pointing up in the air and just shooting down. It's raining down on everybody. Mm -hmm. That's more valuable than any kill that you can make. And I love the use of the gamepad because you look down and you can see which side is covered in paint. Mm -hmm. And also if you have the – you also have, like, uh, kill streak bonuses. My favorite one, of course, being the rocket where you launch it. Uh, uh, using the gamepad where you want to land and then you just see that area slowly turn from the other color to your color and it's so it's satisfying. Awesome. It's great. You just see how it's like, oh, there's some little fuckers right there trying to mess with that. Well, boom! It's so good. And also the tornado gun. We're shooting those big tornadoes oh, of yeah. ink. Well, and the weapons, and this is not something I would expect out of this game, not only do they all feel unique but they actually have some weight behind them and yeah. like each weapon... Uh, no matter what class it's in, they all have a different feel to them. And it's great because you can really find a weapon that fits your style and what you want to do and how you want to help your team out. And it's just, it's, the oh God, the level designs are wonderful That's too. That's exactly where I was going. Yeah. Oh my God. The level designs are perfect. They're so good. Like it almost, it's almost like a throwback to when I used to play Goldeneye with my friends. Yeah. Where like the levels are, are perfect for just like funneling you towards each other. And it's just, oh my God. It's, it's, so good. it's a game that does not design its stages to resemble anything. It's really weird because they'll say, oh, this is the mall or something like that. And mm. you play something like Call of Duty, which obviously has great stages. You play something like uh, Battlefield, which obviously has some very awesome stages. This is just, like you said, a lot like GoldenEye where it's just, why is there just this platform on this second floor that's sticking out? Mm-hmm. Because it gives you an advantage. They don't even – because basically uh, Splatoon is a, is a sport. You know, It's an actual sport in this, in this universe. Mm-hmm. So they just say, oh, whatever. This is just a – this is what we like to watch. This is how they design it for competitive play. And there are a variety of modes that you can play, but that ink battle is what it's all about. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun. Also, just the way that the online works, which a lot of people uh, are, you know, they kind of begrudge it, but I, I really appreciate it, was whenever you turn on the game, like every three hours, these two girls go on the screen, they're just like, hey, here's the stages that we're doing. You only get two stages at a time for competitive play and free play. So you never know what you're actually going to be getting yourself into, and that's just such an exciting concept where a lot of other uh, first-person shooters are about giving you control, like which map are we going to next, and mm-hmm. which they still do in this game. This one removes a key element by saying, Nope, you just got these two, and if you want to play the other two, you got to go into competitive play. And the the post release updates that have been all of this free DLC, mm-hmm. it's an embarrassment of riches with brand new stages and brand new weapons. And, and I mean, like the NES Zapper was released on there, and that oh, was so cool. cool. Well, yeah, the the level of support Nintendo has given to the community is incredible, and I love I love the the two Squid Girls, the whole environment that you're in, the fact that there's this like hub overworld where you can buy cool clothes, and, and all the characters in the stores where the guys like, yeah, whatever, buy something, you know, like there's different some yeah, of them are more jokey. So so much Nintendo personality that are thrown into these characters that would literally in any other squad based shooter would just be menus. And there's a single player mode that is okay. It's pretty good single yeah, player it's mode. It's not bad. It's good for kind of learning the ropes and understanding well, the, the deeper mechanics of the game. If you want the best guns, you got to go through there. I got that, that too. But I mean, all in all, I you know, Call of Duty is the best first person shooter of the year. My opinion, strongly believe it. I will defend it. But for best shooter overall, online, on the for the year, online. 
right there. It has to be Splatoon. It's such a, it's a. It, Nintendo mm. took a concept and reinvented it, and this is a sign of Nintendo's uh, younger uh, creators, the younger designers, really stepping up and creating new concepts that that are, I think, going to engage a wider audience. I feel like Splatoon really spoke to all people of different generations, children and adults, and just yeah. uh, just quick note, even though it's only in America, just a really great ad campaign of I'm a kid now, I'm a squid now. It's It became a whole meme, but not one that was just kind of like, man, what a stupid advertisement. One that it was... It's goddamn amazing. It's a very cute idea, and just the design on the characters, and if you look... Uh, at the haircuts and everything, they actually do have all of the squid appendages. They're all hidden within these kids. And mm-hmm. I know some people didn't like the art style, but I thought it was it was fantastic. Yeah, it's it's great. And it, it, this is Nintendo at their very best, where yep. they're they're not only being innovative, but they're they're taking something that is sort of familiar and presenting it in a way where it's like, you know what, everyone can play this game. If you're five or you're fifty, if you've been playing Nintendo games your whole life. Or if you're brand new to Nintendo games, and it's fucking amazing. The funny thing is, while I play it today, and as much as I'm praising it right now, I look at it and go, "Man, I don't like this game as much as I like its sequel." Where's its sequel? It hasn't been announced yet. It was, maybe it's being created. I don't know. But deep down in my gut, I realize that what they do next, hopefully, and I really believe this, mm-hmm. will surpass this on every single level. If they're when they launch the NX, Nintendo, you need to launch it alongside a a Mario game and well, of B. A, sp- a sequel to Splatoon. Oh it, my god, you, I would love that so much. I, that is a system seller. I that is a real system seller, mm-hmm. and I think that when you look at the Japanese charts, that proves it right there. People went out in droves and bought this game. Japan does not like shooters. They went out and bought lots of copies of Splatoon. Wasn't Call of Duty selling pretty well in Japan too, though? Yeah, for a few weeks. Splatoon mm-hmm. isn't left. It's still hanging out. Yeah, in the top Splatoon 10. is like the uh, the Minecraft for Vita of, of 2015. It just won't drop off the top it's 10. It's the Skate 3 of Japanese charts. <laughs> so Splatoon, number five. Keep them coming. We love it. Number four of the best games of 2015 is Rise of the Tomb Raider. Which let me tell you guys, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. You played Rise of the Tomb Raider or regular Tomb Raider from uh, 2013, the reboot, right? Yeah, I played the reboot. I did not play the new one. This new game takes everything that was right about it. It keeps all of that combat and makes it just as satisfying as it was before. Mm-hmm. But I gotta be honest with you, I didn't really want to fight anything because exploration was so much fun. This is essentially a Metroidvania in 3D, uh, also like kind of a pseudo open world game. It really takes Laura and brings her into a new part of her life where she's already accomplished so much and now she's actually going to be choosing to go on an adventure, which is very different. She's choosing to go out there and take on all of these enemies. Which it's my also, favorite kind of book, Choose Your Own Adventure. <laughs> yeah, which also is kind of problematic because while she hates violence, she still is choosing to kill all these people. But what makes this game amazing is is the amount of approaches you can take within combat. You can actually go stealthy and sneak up and take out individual people, which is so satisfying, especially when you unlock the ability to shoot two people in the head with uh, two arrows at once. Mm. So good. Sounds uh, gross. It's, Very it, gory. It, fantastic sound effects. It has the best graphics of the <laughs> year. But what I love is that they have all these tombs, which I'll say uh, aren't, aren't, aren't real puzzles. They're not really all that challenging. You just go into this tomb... Uh, it takes a while, and once you're in there, maybe it'll take you about 10 minutes maximum to uh, figure out what you're doing and then just, you know, uh, grab the object inside. But it's the procedure of doing it that's so rewarding to see Laura just, uh, you know, naturally figure out, oh, if I put this bag of sand here and that bag of sand there, I'm making this up. This is not actually a puzzle in there because I don't want to spoil any of the puzzles. And then opening up this door, it's so satisfying to pick up that relic, which will actually give you a brand new ability, giving you the incentive to go through those puzzles. Mm -hmm. I can't help but just love this game because I wanted to explore everything. I wanted to do everything. And I actually really enjoyed the story, which got a couple of knocks. Some people said the story wasn't great. What's fantastic about the story isn't what's what's in those cutscenes. It's all of the uh, the found journals. You know, every game you find journals. It's pretty common. Recordings, mm-hmm. nothing new. But my God, the voice acting and writing in those sections is incredible because it dates back centuries ago. You learn all these different stories about people that have come to this land over the course of you know six hundred years to find this legend, which I obviously don't want to spoil. Mm -hmm. You find old Soviet bases. You hear about how the Soviets invaded this area, the rise of the Soviets, and how they collapsed, because obviously there's no Soviet army there at that moment. So you hear this whole war between the Soviets and how they enslaved these native people. It's amazing. But just the way the world is built, 
the way that it looks, the way that it feels so natural. Mm-hmm. Like it really feels like you are part of the world that you're in, you're, you're going into areas that haven't been seen for 500 years. It's so special. And I'm, I, I, I cannot wait for this to come on the PlayStation four. So more people can experience it because it really truly is the fourth best game of the year. One that I wish could, I could have, if the, any other year, this could have been the game of the year, any other year, but we had so many amazing titles that it, Unfortunately, he's only at number four. Same with Splatoon. I want to stress this. 2015 was actually a damn good year for video games. Mm -hmm. So when something only gets 10 or when something only gets four, it's not like, well, I just want to play the top three. You should be playing every single one of these games. Rise of the Tomb Raider, if you only got PS4 or PC, wait in 2016. It's going to be worth every single moment you had to wait. You're going to love it. I've overhyped it, and now you're going to hate it. Whatever. That's what I'm going to do. I'll play it. I'll hate it. (laughs) Okay. Number three. No. With a bicycle kick. Oh, God. Is Rocket League. Oh, Doctor. Oh, yes. The invention of Oh, Doctor. Justin. Hi. Rocket League. I'm still here. We had a lot of fun together on Rocket League, didn't we? We had a lot of fun apart also on Rocket League. In the one-player mode? Yeah. I practiced my skills. (laughs) It's not very fun to play one-player, though. Let me say, one-on-one, that's just fundamentals. Rocket League, for me, is an intangible. It's something that's so... Unexpected. Yeah, unexpected. It's a game that, you know, I could see it falling apart in so many different ways mm-hmm. where it shouldn't have succeeded whatsoever. If you've not played it, you're a car. You uh, you can collect little rocket boosters that are on this field because you're playing a, a game of it's soccer, like soccer yep. instead of a dome that allows you to drive up walls because you're in an encaged dome. You mm-hmm. can jump. You can you fly. C- you can use a rocket boost to fly. You can jump and you can double jump. There's and all these random skills you can learn. But, but the skills that you're learning... Are, are at first intentional, like jumping and double jumping and side jumping. But mm-hmm. beyond that, all of the skills are within the player itself. Right, Remember yeah. when I was talking about mm-hmm. expressing yourself earlier? That's really what this game provides. You can just come up with your own techniques, your own ideas, where it's like just the idea of the pitch, whether you've got three cars on one side and three cars on the other. How are you going to approach hitting that ball? Deep down, you have an idea of what works better than anything else, and it probably is nothing like mine. And then you're we like, oh, you got you to drive all the way slightly to the side and then just do a right jump. It's like, what? No, no, you go right towards the center and do a backflip. No, no, because it's so special. I don't even know what to mm-hmm. compare this to. There's really nothing else like it. Yeah, if, if you haven't played it, it's just destruction derby soccer, I guess. And the reason this game edged out Splatoon for me is because it not only reinvigorated my love of competitive online multiplayer, but also... Like I found a new love for basically what's a sp- it's a sports game. It's a sports game, <laughs> which is crazy. Like if if you would have told me a year or two ago, like oh, one of your favorite games of the year is going to be uh, an online competitive sports game with I cars, I would have laughed at you. Yeah, with fucking cars, racing sports. These are all things that do not apply to me. And this game is so much fun, and it also has that Splatoon quality to it, where there's a lot of there's a lot of depth and strategy if you really want to get into it. But it's also the kind of game where you can jump in, and if you've never played before, even if you don't know all your the different things, your kid sister would like it. Yeah, you can just jump in and have a, a ton of fun with it and the games are always competitive short. And they're super close they're short what is the match type is always five minutes right yeah mm-hmm. five minutes and it's also also worth noting out this also got the award for worst game of 2015 no it i have places to be rocket league <laughs> and i have to be there on time stop being so much fun it's mm-hmm. it's that ooh piece of candy ooh piece of candy where it's kind of like you know Talking what? about Candy Crush? Maybe I don't need to take a shower today. I could just uh, play one more match here. It is the so most. Is that what you were doing this morning? Yeah, yeah, it is the most addictive game of 2015, hands down. Uh, Nothing mm-hmm. even comes close to the nature of Rocket League and just compelling you to keep fucking playing. And and you keep getting better. You go back like a day later, and you're like, oh man, all of a sudden I'm better at Rocket League. When did that happen? Yeah. Oh man, I'm not as good. I got to practice. Oh man, I'm doing okay, but I can oh, do I better. Can do bicycle kicks. It doesn't matter. Whatever your mood is. That game will convince you that you should probably keep on playing, and it's it's beautiful too. Let's not oversee that part. Oh, it is a very gorgeous game, and mm-hmm. we I haven't really had a chance to mess around with any of the stuff they just added. But now they've got hockey in there, ice hockey. Now they got the mutator mode where you had square balls. That square ball is a ton of fun. I I just you know what? There is nothing better than joining a match late when there's only like two minutes left and scoring five goals and leaving. Because they've been they've been playing their own little mind games, and you yeah. just come You're in there, and you don't know what's going on, so you just start doing it. Oh my god! I mean, Rocket League. I, I, I mean, everyone should play this. Yeah, you Justin, fix to. your internet. I want to play with you guys. I will fix it now that I'm going to buy that thing. <laughs> buy the thing. Fantastic. That will fix it, right, Colin? Yeah. yeah. The I, internet I, fixing device. Anything else about Rocket League, guys? Anything? No, it's it's the best. It's it doesn't matter. Car customization. It's one of the best games 
Ever. One of my favorite games of all time. Mm-hmm. It's so much fun. I feel like if I hope we're in that, I hope we're in the day and age where we don't have that uh, point where we lose servers and we can't play a game online anymore. I hope we're past that at this point because I never want to lose Rocket League. You know, and, and one thing I can say about it too, just to talk about like the game's longevity and how really just fun it is, flat out. I can't remember since I got my PlayStation Four. I don't think there's been a single moment where I haven't had at least one friend online playing Rocket League. That's exactly. Like, people are just on all I mean, the time. And yeah, it was a PlayStation Plus free game. But honestly, if this was, you know, if this was a boxed game, it would still be right where it is. It's mm-hmm. so good, so so good. When when do we see one of these Rocket League cars come to uh, Smash Brothers? Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Number two. Of the best games of 2015. Remember, everybody, stay determined. It's got to be Undertale. Mm-hmm. It's oh, got baby. to be Undertale. I want to get this out of the way real, Did real Steve, quick. Steve, you ever play this? Yeah, I yeah. played it. My biggest issue with Undertale is how some people like to talk about Undertale. Like, yeah, agreed. Oh, you, you never played this game before? It's so crazy. Like, there's skeletons in it. <laughs> like, that's going to be a selling point, yeah. People want to take, like, the lol what approach when describing Undertale which undersells everything that makes it so fantastic, right. which is the game, mm-hmm. you know, is literally and uh, figuratively all about heart. It is the best, now not the best story, but the hands on the best writing of the year. Oh, absolutely. Like, all, all you babies are online crying for a new Earthbound. Fuck it, go play Undertale. Oh, my God. <laughs> if you like Earthbound and you didn't play this, now, and it, to, uh, maybe people haven't heard about this. This is probably a lesser-known title, even though it's at number two. This is a game that is a looks like an NES RPG from back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, Great music. My God, the music is so good. What happens is you go into battles, but rather than uh, fighting people like in a turn-based combat, of course that's available to you. Mm-hmm. When, you're def- when you're defending yourself from attacks, you just have this little heart that you control. It's almost like a bullet hell shooter where you don't have a gun, you know, and you have to dodge these attacks and to take different approaches to them. It's a concept that could have been so easily mismanaged and yet somehow is always compelling because boss fights have their own ways to do things. Characters have a lot of personality, like enemies and... Mm-hmm. And you'll just bump into these monsters, and uh, instead of fighting them, you can talk to them. One of my favorite ones, they always have uh, action, and the actions are always different for all these creatures. You'll, you'll pick this one creature, and it says, pick on or don't pick on. And if you pick don't pick on, he goes, finally, somebody gets it. Yeah. And, then it <laughs> and then you can just spare him, and then you don't have to fight him. It's a game yeah. about pacifism as well. It's it's so guys tell me about Undertale. Let's not spoil the story because it's so good. I think well the thing that's really great about Undertale uh, that I think the best examples of games that are pastiches of older styles of games but try and subvert uh, some of the tropes that those games have is Undertale does everything that old school RPGs like Earthbound do right. But at the same time, it's incredibly critical of RPGs as like a genre. So the mm-hmm. fact that you can do a passive run. Yeah, absolutely. Is just incredible because that's something you don't think about. And then when you're thinking about, okay, all these games that I grew up playing, like, you know, the Dragon Warrior series or the early Breath of Fire Final Fantasy games, like, all you're doing is you're just walking around, you're encountering, like, oh, you ran into a a fucking slime, this little slime with a smiley face, and now I'm going to hack the shit out of it. And there's no, like, repercussions or bigger discussions of why you're just well, hacking just keep, the shit out of everything. They keep just randomly regenerating forever, too. Yeah, they randomly regenerate forever, and you're just killing these wild creatures. And those games never stop to say, hey, why, why are you doing this? It was just like, oh, there's monsters. Monsters bad. You kill Level monster. Up. Level up. Get better. Get stronger. Grind, grind, grind. Yeah. And Undertale says, no, wait, let's, let's take this really basic RPG concept and kind of pump the brakes and actually think about what you're doing and if you Make play pacifist play fun, yeah. it's it's basically a puzzle game meets a bullet hell shooter which mm-hmm. is really interesting and what i love so much about the game is when it comes to its writing is a lot of people have no idea how to be funny yeah, you know they just don't get it they don't get they don't get it and this game is something that somehow uh repeats itself but it doesn't run the joke into the ground it i mean uh one mm-hmm. of my favorite moments in the game is walking around a snowy forest and there's a save point and it, there's just a microwave and a plate of spaghetti and a mouse hole. And it says, uh, the idea that one day the mouse will learn how to warm the spaghetti fills your heart with determination. It's such a stupid sentence. Mm-hmm. But for some reason... All the mouse hole... It's inspiring. Yeah, you yeah. actually get inspired by it. It's just a stupid yeah. statement. Well, and, and that's definitely some of the... like the You can see the earthbound influence there as yeah, well. Absolutely. Which the, the writing is just like... It's this 
kind of like slightly left to center off the wall humor that's not just like oh look at how crazy I am memes like it doesn't do that it's just it's just weird it's just enough quirk where you're like oh <laughs> I, I think it's almost like zen humor where if you actually think about what the game says it'll put you in a meditative state but at the same time oh, you can just chuckle and move on mm -hmm. and th the characters in this game uh, Sans is, is so great of a character. Well, He's and because you can choose to kill or uh, not kill everything, you can either make friends with a lot of these bosses yeah. who are at the time like kind of, you know, like, oh, man, this guy's actually kind of scary. And then they're hilarious, and you actually like get to know them as like, I don't know how they do that so well, to be honest with you. I yeah, it's it's always, I, I felt it was it was more rewarding not to kill shit. Oh, like, never <laughs> kill shit. Because it was just worth it because the writing is so good that you're like, okay, I don't want to kill this guy because I kind of want to see how I interact with him later. But then you I, get a totally different storyline if you kill somebody. Let's, mm -hmm. uh, just like RPGs, though, this is what I love. You have these shops, and you have the option to buy or sell. You can't sell anything to anyone. Everyone goes, why would I want more junk? I'm trying to get rid of junk. Actually, there's <laughs> one place where you can sell things. But but there's the, one of my favorite moments is the two teenage girls in their shop. Yeah, the, I love Just them. the way that they laugh at each other's jokes, and you just like hear all about them. It's 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 a thing that you, I just want to take Undertale and, and 3D print it and just wrap it around myself and keep myself warm. Uh, Metaton is just my favorite villain of all time I, I the thing about that game though is that like I played through it once uh, in a day I actually played through it in a single day because mm -hmm. I couldn't stop playing it I was I could because I walked away and I'm like I really can't stop thinking about that I gotta go back and then when I played through it again it was the same old jokes and you didn't kill everything the second time they were just as funny as the first time that's a big statement about humor especially because this is a reading game you know there's no voice acting you're mm -hmm. reading all the dialogue I still laughed Everything was still unexpected because the timing is pitch perfect, and it's yeah. it, it's done in such a disjointed way that it's so me the punchline is more memorable than the joke, but the setup is equally good. So every time you play through it, you'll still laugh because you mm -hmm. forget about how it gets that bit. Yeah, you know? I, I really I, I want to do a second playthrough of this game, and this is one of the few games that oh, I played in, in the last few years where as soon as I was done, I was like. I want to do more of this, but I, you know, I want to do a kill everything run. I wanted to do that too. It's yeah, to I don't think I can just do it. To see how I change it. I know. It, it, part of me is like, I don't want to do that. But like, not since the original Dark Souls have I finished a game and immediately gone, oh my god, I want to start again. It's every I, I, this need. I, I don't know if it's coming to councils. It needs to. Everyone needs to play Undertale. Mm -hmm. And I know a number of people are just going like, oh my god, why in the hell are people treating this game with with such reverence? And it's because they haven't played it. Trust me. I felt that way. I when I when I started Undertale, I was kind of like I don't. I was know. wondering how what you would think of it. I was be really nervous because whenever people tell me something's great, I'm like, oh great, so I'm going to be the outlier. I'm going to be the guy that doesn't like it. And nope, Undertale, hundred percent. Oh my god, flipped my lid within like the first ten minutes. I couldn't believe what I was experiencing. Such a fun, funny, amazing, beautiful, thoughtful, articulate, and just enjoyable engaging game my god under i just also mm. shout out to all the people who voted for undertale and game faq's greatest game ever poll that they do <laughs> every year and had it beat like legend of zelda i think it's a bit which is hilarious it's a bit disingenuous but i think I that shit it's a game it's faq's hilarious. fucking poll which has happened people still to, use that huh? yeah i know exactly exactly undertale the second best game of the year which was very difficult. And still Jeez. better than Ocarina of Time, motherfuckers. Yeah, suck it, Ocarina. Yeah, I'd take this over Ocarina. Mm -hmm. no, that's not even an issue. Uh, but the number one best game of 2015 is the very controversial <laughs> uh -oh. and wonderful Call of Duty Black Ops 2. Really? It was weird. It didn't even come out this year, but why not? Last year. No Metal Gear Solid on this list? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, by the way, Fallout 4 and uh, The Witcher, uh, those games were too long. <laughs> uh, so they didn't even make the list. Well, I, I have problems with Fallout 4, which I'd be happy to discuss at a later date. The Witcher is one of those games where I know it's probably really great. It's really I just, good. Oh, I talked about this earlier. Games are fucking exhausting in 2015. I don't. I do not have time to play all these things. I haven't had time to play The Witcher. Guys, I, I played a lot of The Witcher and I played a, quite a bit of Fallout 4. But here's the thing. Uh, I'm. I'm not gonna just put them on a list because everyone else told me they were great. I, I need to get farther with them. And mm -hmm. and and the thing is, I didn't feel very compelled to continue with The Witcher. Uh, and I didn't feel necessarily compelled to continue with Fallout 4. No, as Ergo, someone who is, I'm has, not putting uh, it on the list. I, I have trudged through, Fuck your list. through Fallout 4, almost like I have a sense of duty <laughs> to the get through Did the YouTube comments it? just slip through? <laughs> yes. <laughs> is, that, is that YouTube speaking? Uh, Fallout 4, I don't like it. I'd say Fallout 4 is an okay Borderlands game it, and a bad Fallout game. It's a good thing they only announced it six months before release. I think it's, yeah. a, I think it's a very solid... Uh, 
game for what it is, but something that in a year of great games mm-hmm. really needed more yeah. to stand and out. And there's so many things that are like appallingly unfinished or half baked that you're just like, oh god. Like the whole base building thing is mind blowingly uh, shitty. The Witcher Three, on the other hand, I think is actually very good. I just mm-hmm. didn't have enough time with it and uh, for that. But yeah. number one is Metal Gear Solid Five: The yeah, Phantom baby. Pain. Yeah, yeah. Kojima Productions, published by Konami. Drop the mic. What you know about that? Metal Gear Solid Five. Fuck you, Konami. Uh, has two chapters in it. The third chapter was never actually finished, and as such, it, it's a game that has the same problem. It just kind of stops, and it's shocking. It's mm-hmm. it's very problematic. Yet, playing this game more so than the story, more so than than the graphics, which are great, by the way. Mm-hmm. It's just about the play and going into these giant worlds. And and just Fultoning, capturing soldiers and sending them back to your base and sending them into the appropriate areas where they will build you new devices. Building your bases is just crazy. Working alongside D Dog and Quiet and and D Walker, mm-hmm. this game, guys, Metal Gear Solid Five. It's the best game of 2015, just because it's fun to play. Yeah, which yeah. is a surprise for a Metal Gear Solid <laughs> game. You know, just fun to play. Mm-hmm. And I think it does one thing that the other exhausting games of 2015 don't do. And, and don't get me wrong, Metal Gear Solid Five is exhausting. It's it's a 100-plus hour game. It's very overwhelming. Um, but in but good way. They're, they're able to sort of compartmentalize uh, different levels and missions so nothing feels completely overwhelming. Like, it's open world, but not really. Like, you, yeah. you kind of deal in these different hubs. So that's kind of nice. Um, and also, y- there's so many different ways to approach the levels yep. that it's... It's overwhelming at first, but you kind of find a way that works for you. Uh, but yeah, if, if anything, the one thing negative that I can say about Metal Gear Solid Five is it gives you so many choices in how to complete missions that at times you you find yourself like kind of second guessing yourself, and then at probably like the thirty or forty hour mark, you're like, you know what, fuck it, I do things my way, and yeah. that's cool with this game. I think the thing about this game is that it when you start off and you're, you're playing through, it's like this game feels pretty flat. Like there's mm-hmm. really not much to do, and the missions, uh, the mission structure, to be honest, isn't great. Like the missions aren't what make the game great. It's that they have injected the, just the base gameplay with so many possibilities yeah. mm-hmm. that you can you can approach that same pretty generic mission if you think about it in a myriad of ways. Uh, Justin, you are taking on Quiet, which is a very early mission. It's We're not going to spoil mm-hmm. anything about this game. He hasn't beaten it, I have. That was um, an early mission? I've been playing this game for months. I know. <laughs> that's like, no, you, but, you can play the game for like 30 hours and never even leave Afghanistan. But that's know? just it. When you were fighting Quiet, I was like, oh, what'd you, did you snipe her or anything like that? And you said that you were actually calling in supply drops and they were just landing on top yeah, of her. Yeah, yeah. Just knocked her out with some supply drops. <laughs> How? Do you see what I mean, man? I, I I swear to God, I thought I knew everything about this game, and as soon as I That's heard that, weird. I could not believe it. I was like, "You're kidding me!" I never knew that that existed, or the whole thing about you know, obviously going into the bathroom and, pl- and playing the cassette tape, playing the of tape the, of the guy having a bad time in the bathroom. Yeah, the guy taking a shit in the bathroom and going, "Oh!" And if a soldier walks by, they'll leave you alone because they think you're just some guy in the bathroom just taking a shit. I, the or leaving the cardboard boxes around as proxies where they think it's you. Mm-hmm. The way that you can take care of the wandering soldiers by putting on the cardboard box. Yeah. Every, every, okay, it, okay, this is what is amazing about this game. It is a puzzle game if you want it to be. It is an action game if you want it to be. It is a stealth game if you want it to be. You can take so many different approaches. Mm-hmm. There's always there's a solution out there that will make it absolutely easy, but it will require a lot of thought. There's a solution that is perfect stealth, but it will require a lot of patience. And there's one that's perfect action, but it requires a lot of hand-eye coordination. It's so Good guys. Oh, the characters mm-hmm. are amazing too. Yeah. Oh, this is this is maximum Kojima insanity, by the way. Oh yeah. The uh, fault device. Is, is yeah, like ridiculous. It's the 1980s, fault device, but I got my my iDroid. <laughs> yeah, like the Fulton device is is like it's a great mechanic, but it's just it's so goddamn goofy. And if it was in anything Especially other than can, a Kojima yeah, game, you'd be like, yeah. what the fuck? It's it's where you attach balloons to soldiers and it sends them back up to the base. But as it goes on. You it's can like start all, folding everything. Yeah, it's like just I grab want, anything. I'm not gonna fight this tank. I'm gonna run up to it and then put a balloon it on it. Just put a balloon on it. And then later I can just call in that tank. And managing your resources in the game is meaningful. Like I enjoy mm-hmm. managing my resources and building like a perfect team that, that will help me out in the in the best way Deploying possible. Deploying them on missions. Mm-hmm. And man, when you when you're scoping out people with your binoculars, you're like, oh my god, that guy's an A plus in you know engineering. Yeah, and you're, gotta I got a fault in his ass, yep. and that becomes its own mission. Mm-hmm. Just because your desire creates your own missions in this amazing open world within other missions. Also, you ride a horse, 
and there's a button to make the horse poop. Like yep. Kojima's like, you know what this horse needs? A poop button. It's I didn't God, figure God out what to use America. the poop for. I'm sure you can do something. Uh, there's probably something you, you can, can do. You can make with the poop. trucks slip off the road with it. Really? Oh, really? Shit. Every, everything in the game does <laughs> oh, something. God, I did not know that. Everything in the game does something and it does it's 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 the world interacting with itself. It's mm. so much fun. I mean, I I don't know about you, but I would just have fun sometimes going into an area and poisoning everybody except for one last soldier. So he's like, what the hell is going yeah, on? Yeah, I love doing that too. Oh, my God. Or interrogating everybody. Yeah. yeah. Speech. You can find out about some pretty cool things. They'll tell you, like, uh, randomly, one of them will just give you, like, a location of some strange, like, blueprint or something. Spin you didn't it know out. About. Yeah. Spin right it exactly. out. I, I, I don't know. And, it, you know, much like Undertale, it's a game that encourages pacifism, but perhaps for selfish reasons where, like, you know, I could kill you, but I'm, you know, I really want this silent sniper rifle, so I'm going to take you back to my base. And mm-hmm. also, here's the craziest thing about this game: so you, uh, you, you take all these soldiers, you can play as every soldier that you take, yeah, and mm-hmm. level them up individually. You can send them on missions a- as them instead of playing as Snake. It's insane. It's mind blowing. It's so bonkers. And not only that, but I, it's a game that uh, it's very. Am- it's very ambitious with its day night cycle mm-hmm. because you'll go into bases and you'll pick off everybody with headshots and then you keep doing that night after night and then they just start beefing up security so you go right when the, you know right in the morning and there's nobody else there you're like aha because they've they've figured out what your schemes are mm-hmm. i just like I, it's one of those games where it's impossible to to explain it because mm-hmm. it's just like i don't know it's an open world stealth game well there's yeah. just so many weapons even, to like, develop too the surface. yeah yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. It's like 50 billion different like grenade launch, every, all these damage wi- dealing guns. So you're like, okay, I'm supposed to be a pacifist in this, but yeah, I just I wish like I could trade in all the other big open world games with crafting systems yeah, and for base the building. Third act of this yeah. game. I just I just want uh, yeah, let me just like trade in all those. Just give me Metal Gear Solid so I can just focus entirely on it. Like I just I want to keep playing it more and more and more. And that's just it because even though. It fell apart. It didn't have that third act that it mm-hmm. really needed. Yeah, yeah. Like I said earlier, it's about approach and it's about play. And it's that style of play that easily makes it the absolute best game of 2015 and one of the best games of all time. It's a stunning achievement, and it just shows how much talent that studio has. Mm-hmm. And w- with Kojima's relationship with Konami, thank God this thing came out. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. Right? This could have been- Especially because like, when, you, when you're playing through the missions, like at the end and the beginning of every mission, it's like a Kojima production designed by Kojima. Kojima, <laughs> Kojima, the most Kojima, Kojima. Written by Kojima. Kojima, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> this game gets into your blood. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I, like I said, every time I play a game now and somebody's shooting at me with a sniper rifle, I just start going, the enemy sniper. Just crawl on your belly and he won't be able to catch you. Like, I start hearing <laughs> these characters speaking to me. And the voice acting, even though David Hayter's not in the game, it's great voice it's acting. It's Kiefer Sutherland, actually. Yeah, they should have replaced David Hayter with Bill Hayter. Oh, my God. What about all those music tapes? You can just oh, find yeah, all those yeah, tapes. Yeah. Like, Kids in America. Yeah. Which is nuts, too. Man, this, this, yeah, this, this game has so much licensed music that they clearly paid a lot of money for, but it's like... It's all totally it's all like eggs. inconsequential to what's going on. It's just like, yeah, you can just totally find a Hall and Oates song that they probably paid a million dollars for. Yeah, but then whatever. you can you can have that. I have that song playing when my helicopter comes in. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> man eater every time. We're not even talking about the helicopter yet. I didn't, even you, know you, I didn't know you could set the music tapes to play when things. Yeah, happen. It, it, it strikes fear you, into enemies. Yeah, you hear man eater playing as your helicopter's flying over your head to pick you up. It's pretty cool. Oh my! See now I gotta go boot it back up so I can try that. I mean, just like dealing with wildlife and capturing animals and having your own zoo and gaining new abilities you know by uh, you know capturing new blueprints and mm-hmm. creating new guns and new hands i mean i got a hand from zone the enders that j- it's a it, it's 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 the it fires a rocket it's ridiculous it makes no sense whatsoever what but the hell that sounds like mega man legends or something. <laughs> he does a he does well that's the rocket fist what does the hand of jedo d do oh what it does is it it reaches out like a good three feet and snatches people and pulls them forward for oh, you God. it's like a stretchy arm i like That's I don't, insane. I feel like if we sat down and talked about how we approached each mission in that game, I'd be like, "What you can do that? Whoa, you can what? We, yeah. you can do oh, that? it's a total water cooler game. Yeah, where yeah, you just you can talk to people about it. Like we are now. Like obviously, we've discussed this game before. We've talked about it on the show. We've talked about it outside of the show. And just by having this conversation now, we're like, "Oh fuck, you can do that? That's so cool. What the fuck? I didn't even play Metal Gear Online. No, fuck no. the online. All it does is make my load <laughs> times go." Up, up Skyrocket. Oh, also, yeah. I don't want people stealing my shit. Like, get out of my base. Yeah, you can't really. And I, I don't want to pay for like Kojima fucking mafia protection. <laughs> can we also? Can we say right here? <laughs> this game is obviously the best game of the year, but also has the best sprint. 
when Snake is running, he is fucking booking he's it. Booking yeah. it. <laughs> he's serious and he doesn't get tired. He can just keep booking it. Yeah. I love that sprint. It is so satisfying, especially if you run up into a dive and knock somebody over. Mm -hmm. And also just the way that when you approach a mission, just like sniping, you know, running into a room, throwing somebody on the ground, you know, going into slow motion and sniping somebody uh, in the head with your uh, your tranquilizer dart. It's always satisfying, especially mm -hmm. when you, you you're just about to be caught and it doesn't happen. Those stun grenades oh, yeah. too are, are amazing. Oh my god, the stun grenades! It's it's one of those games where unfortunately you can't say what that one thing is. You just say gameplay, but that doesn't really mean anything. No. Undertale, you could say it's the writing. You know, uh, Rocket League, you could say once again it's it's. The co-op experience? It's yeah. the play. It's the online mm -hmm. play. Rise of the Tomb Raider, it's the exploration. But somehow Metal Gear Solid, even as bare bones as it is, it's all of those things together. And there, yet, even with all the problems with, with the third act not being there, there are these mm -hmm. beautiful story moments uh, that just are, are perfect. But, yeah, that second, that second act is really screwed up because of the way that their budget was treated. But I cannot state... How good this game is. And it's a game that's available on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. How the hell did you do that? <laughs> yeah, that's I wild. didn't even know that. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wild stuff. Wild stuff. You've seen that PlayStation. Uh, and also, 60 frames a second. Can we talk about that for a second? They took the oh, time yeah. to make it 60 frames. It runs like frames. magic. It, I, I never had any frame rate problems, really. I, I can think of a couple of instances. Shit, just, just, just uh, disconnect from the online. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. Once I disconnected from the online, and I think like about a week in, they patched the game, and then I never experienced frame rate dips again. It's so good. Mm hmm. D Dog is still pretty useless. I mean, yeah. D, D, uh, D Horse. I'm sorry. D Horse. D -horse. I don't really like D Horse. <laughs> but I love D Dog. Did you get the puppy yet, by I the way? I still didn't get the puppy. I went you back to those the missions that you guys said, that, and I didn't get the puppy. I still will pat the dog in the head and go, good dog, good dog, even though I know it barely does, even though I have maximum relationship, just because I'm in there, man. Ah! Oh, my God. It's really good. Metal it's Gear Solid. It's we could really talk about this all day. We Metal Gear do a Solid is uh, it's good video game. Why don't we do a Metal Gear special next week? We can't because you didn't beat the game, and you know. Well, give it, me like another month. You don't have the dog. Yeah. I'm base building. I want A's across the board in every every one of my soldiers. It's a base building game. It's a strategy game then, because you also send them out on missions. Yeah, good. but not in a shitty way like that Call of Duty Black Ops Two mode. Oh no, no, <laughs> we're not talking <laughs> oh, about God, that. Oh god, this is gonna be another hour here. Okay, fine. We should shut up. But we have difficulty shutting up about Metal Gear. And mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of stuff we, we could say about Undertale. But all yeah. of these games are great. And you should check out every single one that we've talked about. Except for Fallout 3. Fuck Fallout 3. You mean or 4. No, Fallout 4. No, oh, no wow, play Fallout 3. Wow. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Where were you in 2009? Fallout 4 is a fine game. Uh, it's fine. As is The Witcher 3. It's very addictive. Right. Yeah, I know. I'm talking mad shit about Fallout 4, but I probably dropped 100 hours into it. It would be so, disingenuous you know. to include them on this list. So if that's what you're going yeah. for, seriously, go play Undertale. Go play Metal Gear Solid. Go play Rocket League. Did we League. forget anything here? No. No. That's no. everything. This is, these are the absolute mm -hmm. best games. Go play everything Digital Devolvers put out in the last year. My God, you got that right. They, they, they are still consistently like the best publisher out there. Oh, I got one more that I'm going to throw out there. Uh -huh. if, you like, if you like point-and-click adventure games with an isometric 3D uh, perspective, sort of like uh, <laughs> uh, what was it called? Sanitarium back in the 90s. Yeah. Okay. There's this game called Stasis, and it fucking rules. Play that. You're gonna end it on Stasis. I'm gonna end it on Stasis, bitches. Congratulations, Hideo Kojima, on your new ventures. We can't wait to see what you're gonna do because your game from 2015, Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain, punish, punish Snake, punish Venom Snake, no mm -hmm. more. Praised Venom Snake. It's a pretty, pretty, pretty good. Absolutely. That's, what else can you say well, about Senko that? Senko Jima, that penis statue. The mm -hmm. best game of 2015. Enough said. Yeah, you weren't in the Golden Dawn, Kojima. You earned it. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, where can people reach you on the internet? Hey, you can find me on the World Wide Web. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Steve Cuff. That's at Steve C U F F. That's at Steve C U Friendly Face. Uh, you can also go to OptimismVaccine.com and guess what? We have a bunch of top five end of the year lists. We've got things covering television, movies, video games, In television, and we got a special spin on it because every single goddamn website that you're going to go to is going to these are the ten best games. These are the ten best movies. No, you know, we're doing you one more. We're doing things specifically. 11. <laughs> we're doing we're doing eleven. We're literally doing eleven. No, we're doing top five lists of things that are a little bit off the beaten track. So I have I've got a list of top five games you didn't play in 2015. Uh, there's top five albums you didn't listen to. Top five movies that aren't going to win an Oscar this year. Things like that. 
It's really fucking cool. We also have a podcast. It's on iTunes. You can look for it. It's called the Opfat Cast. Just search for Opfat Cast or Optimus Vaccine, and you can hear me and my homies talk about weird shit. You're gonna like the Opfat Cast. So remember to get five stars and a written yeah, review. To five that. stars. Uh, you but can do this for one first, and then yeah, do absolutely, that. this yeah. one is more important. Exactly. Do that. <laughs> Sorry. Seriously, Opfat Cast. Yeah. Very, very good program. It's good. Pub culture. Great mayhem. guys. Yeah. Tweet, it's, tweet a stick pics. It, you know what the best thing about the Outback cast is? It's not about the stuff you already know. It's about the things you didn't. And that's yeah. more exciting. It's and sometimes the, st- the things you don't want to know about. It's going to be the things that you're going to tell your friends all about. You're going to learn so much from it. you got to check it out. Justin, where can people reach you on the internet? You can still find me at Justin and Colin on YouTube. This channel is growing. I had three videos in the last two weeks. That's a lot for me. That's pretty exciting. So uh, i got to get one more up, and we're going to do some more this week. Right, Colin? You got it. You, you're like PewDiePie. All That's right. the only place to find me. You can reach me on Twitter at Dr. Karate Chop. That's at Dr. Karate Chop. You want to follow the Pressure Cast? It's simple, my friends. Just go to Pressure Cast Pod. That's at Pressure Cast Pod. Also, go to youtube.com slash video games are dumb. Check out a bunch of new videos, uh, including Super Mario Galaxy, which was re released on mm. the Wii U eShop, and uh, the other game, the Trails of Cold Steel. The other game. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of stuff coming up. We can't wait to see you in 2016 in January. Uh, uh, you know what, guys? We were talking about a lot of games that unfortunately didn't have the best endings, like Tales from the Borderlands, Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain. Regardless, those things were great. But the pressure cast needs never needs to worry about endings. No. No, no, my friends, because the pressure cast is forever. Mm-hmm. Pressure Cast Weekly Video Game News Podcast is solely owned and operated by Colin Tanner. Guests of the Pressure Cast are not employees or freelancers of Colin Tanner, the Pressure Cast, or VideoGamesAreDumb.com, and are not paid. Music featured on the Pressure Cast is property of their respective owners, and no infringement is intended. For more information, email PressureCast at gmail.com. Hey, welcome back to Car Talk. This is Bick and Beck, the Becker Brothers, and uh, we're talking about bars, Hello. bar repairs, and everything you could do with your car right there. Uh, uh, but remember, don't drive like my brother. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, I don't drive very yeah, well anymore. Drive. All right, we got a caller right here. Uh, it's Steve from Milwaukee. Uh, come right in. What's wrong with your car? You got a problem with one of your cars? Uh, hey, guys. Uh, first time caller, uh, long time listener. I just wanted to say... I love you guys. I had a problem, Oh, thank though. you so I, much. I, 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 oh, I, where, I, where are you looking for another wife? <laughs> <laughs> your oh. wife doesn't like your car, does she? <laughs> no, my wife no. tells me, uh, fix, get that heap out of the garage. No, actually, um, my, my wife died on our wedding night. But uh, Oh, Jesus, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get another call All here. All right, what do we got over here? We got Susan from Baltimore. Hey, it's me, Susan. Oh, uh, not it's Susan again. again. Let's get her out of oh here. Oh, my God. I made you guys some bologna sandwiches. Where do I mail them? Oh, you, you got to mail them to Harvard, Off-Fair City. <laughs> Off-Fair City, Harvard. <laughs> we go fuck this. Let's start <laughs> <over>. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are like getting bloody sandwiches in the back. <laughs> uh, okay. Fuck the forest.